Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is January 25th, 2024, and really, really happy to be here for another video in a series of oral histories with Fahrenheit 451. And uh, Frank, you want to go ahead and say just a little bit about yourself, like a sentence or two, like the position you you have in Fahrenheit 451, and then I'll ask you about your family history and background. Sure. So we're going to be, uh, I play guitar at Fahrenheit 451. Um, we started back early in the 90s, that's Fahrenheit 451. Really transgressed through um, without a cause and a band, but, you know, always been uh, one of the main writers and one of the main lyricists. Uh, playing guitar at Fahrenheit. All right, great. So you want to start off by telling us a little bit about your family history and background, both sides if you know, and whatever you might know about how they ended up in the Bronx. Sure, yeah. Uh, my Both of my parents are uh, originally from the Dominican Republic. Uh, my parents have uh, been together, I believe, in their teens. They started, wow. you know. Um, they met, you know, when my father would ask permission of you know, my grandparents to come over, like a couple of days before, to ask permission to see if he could go and take and get a soda pop. Yeah, you know, and you know that's how it, it you know, began the Villalona family. Uh, my father, uh, he applied for a visa to come into the United States during that time in the Dominican Republic. Um, my family on my father's side was heavily political. Okay, sure, and um. They also supported um, uh, Trujillo, okay, okay, who sure. later kind of became a dictator. Yeah, and they had to flee the country. I see. Right, and um, my father came here along with um, my aunts um, and my uncle. Yeah, and when they came, when he came over here, he started working. He went to Taft High School at night to get his GED. Wow. He went and once he. Um, he applied to uh, visas for my mother and my two sisters, who they were all born in the Dominican Republic. Um, he had all the credentials. He had the GED. He was working, um, and you know they came over. I believe that was like '66. Oh, uh, okay. Do you 60... know what neighborhood in the Bronx? That they yeah, were at first, at my understanding, was off of, um, Freeman Street and okay. and. Southern uh, Bronx. Yeah, 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 sure. That's where they originally uh, went there. I think it was a two bedroom apartment. Yeah. Um, then they moved over to um, 121 Elliott Place in the Morris, Morris Heights section, uh, yeah. Morris Sinai section of the Bronx. Sure. Um, then my, my father applied for a, a citizenship. He became an American citizen. And then um, they had me. Me was 69, November 8, 1969. Okay. And uh, my father continued working. He was a, a sheet metal fabricator. Yeah. Uh, one of his main things, his specialties, they used to fabricate all the shell the shelling uh, for X-ray machine rooms. Wow. You know. Which was it in the Bronx? City? You in the Bronx, it's it was called um, IAC uh, International Acoustic Corporation. Wow. And that's what he did. He did that for forty five years. Wow. He retired. Um, I think he retired about 55, he retired, yeah. you know, he was with that company for about 45 years, wow. you know, um, he retired, uh, my mother, when she came here to uh, the United States, you know, obviously she was taking care of my sisters and I, uh, but then she also became a seamstress, she uh, worked as a seamstress, uh, and the reason she spoke, uh, worked as a seamstress, because uh, my aunt on my father's side, uh, was a seamstress, and she had her own business on the side, which she would, um, uh, if you came to her, you needed a wedding dress or anything, she yeah. would put that together. Wow. You so know? really, really skilled. Then, huh? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of, you know, singer um, uh, sewing machines sound in, a, in, a, in the apartment. At one point, there were two or three. Wow. You know? Uh, so, yeah, so um, that's where, you know, my, my family comes from, Dominican Republic. We do have family from... Uh, apparently, my sister did one of those ancestry dot com yeah. type thing that it showed that we had uh, a leaner a, a lineage of uh, from France and Spain. Okay, sure, sure, you sure. You know, um, but both of them were from the Dominican Republic. And do you know where in the Dominican Republic? Both yeah, uh, well, my father's family was um, is uh, is called Ecruzen. Okay, yeah. 
like the crossing. And there they had a horse ranch, cattle ranch, you know. Uh, and my, my mother, she was born the country, both a country, yeah. but she was a little bit more deep in the country, more. and it was called Laguna Salada. Right, and there they have they, they still have the property. It was like a sugarcane property where they have fields fields of sugarcane, and you know, and my grandfather, my grandmother, and before them, they would cut down the sugarcane and sell it to wholesalers. Wow, you know, uh, so those are the the two areas where my family came from. Uh, there is one other area which is called Mao, um, and that's more upper elevations in the, in the mountains of the Dominican Republic too. Wow. Yeah. And when you were a child, did you go back to the DR? I did. The only time I went, I believe I was 10 or 11. Okay, yeah. I went with my mother. It's the first time I went out there. I really didn't see much of the country. I, I didn't see the beach. The only time I saw the beach is on the ride from the airport and the ride back to the airport. Wow. You know? <laughs> but I got to see the country. I did go to um, the, uh, the capital. Yeah. Um, I went to Mao. Uh, what I remember from it a lot, it was I got that's the first time I ever rode a scooter. Okay, you know, yes, every everyone had a scooter like it's happening now here yeah, in New York yeah. City. Um, and um, you know, the, a lot of the things that I remember, it was hot. Uh, the worst experience that I had going there was mosquitoes. The mosquitoes were not like New York. You know, they were savages. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, but yeah, that was the only time I went back. You know, I plan to go back. I want to bring my kids and actually explore and look at the country. Yeah. You know, uh, but it was only that one time. And I believe that it was um, 83, 84. Oh, okay, okay. I yeah. see. I see. So when, when you were growing up uh, in the Bronx, uh, you said you had other family members who were your teens. Was it an aunt and an uncle? Yeah, my, uh, my aunt. Uh, she lived, aunt, in, okay. when we moved to Elliott, she... Uh, lived on 123, the Dacia building right next to us. Oh, also, I see. So I then I had my that. cousins like uh, Raisa, um, uh, Rita, Rafael. Uh, they all grew up there. We all grew up together. You know, family functions and stuff like that. Now they're pretty much, you know, spread across the country. The place, I see. Yeah. I see. Uh, and, and what about um, other people that was close to your family in, in the neighborhood? Did your family have a lot of friends and all that? Yeah. Well, one of the main ones was Armando. Of course, yeah. yeah, yeah he, yeah. you know, he sings at Fahrenheit. I think uh, I've known Armando since one years old when he moved to the block. That's crazy. You know, and you know, me and him always together. Yeah. You know, uh, growing up, our families always, you know, went shopping. We used to go to the uh, Pathmark back in the day. Oh, sure, sure, sure. And we used to go to Jersey. Yeah. Right across the, uh, to uh, Bergen, um, Bergen Street in Jersey is Edison. New Jersey, oh, and, okay. yeah, and yeah. you know his mother would tag along too. My, my my dad used to have like you know a Chevy Impala. You yeah. know back then they were boats. Yeah, you know made out of steel. Pile as many people right. as you can have, right, right. And, you know the front seat was a, a couch basically. Yeah. you know it'd be eight people up there. You That's know, crazy. so yeah, we had a lot of functions. Our model's family had, uh, uh, was always involved. Our mom, me and our mother were always hanging out. You know, playing games on the block, watching movies, karate movies. You know, yeah, we were definitely, you know, good buddies. Yeah, you know? yeah. And and what about uh, what about school? What elementary school did you go to? I went to CS sixty four. Okay. okay, with down the block. Um, then I went for middle school. I went to uh, uh, one seventeen Wade. That's right. And Armando went to a different twenty two because right? it was, it was like right on the border at right? that point. You know, Armando was on the same block with me that he moved up the block. So ah, being up the block, I guess the, the zoning yeah. would bring anyone from up the block to 22. Anyone and where I'm at, the zoning would bring them to 117. Ah, okay. um, yeah, 117 was Waze. I forget the name of the, the, the actual person, but the last name was Waze. Yeah. Then from there, um, I applied. I went to Norman Thomas, where you had to take a test. You had to have like an 85 average. So I went to Manhattan. And the reason I went there... Is because my my sister, my middle sister D, she went to uh, Norman Thomas as well, and this was at Thirty Third and Park Avenue. Oh, okay, okay, I see, I see. Yeah, so I went there to Norman Thomas uh, and graduated from Norman Thomas from there. Then yeah. um, I went to um, I did I did complete college, but I did go to um, Long Island University. Okay. Yeah. I went for um, business and jazz studies. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you know that was the time where I had this dream of becoming a you know. Soloist, 
I know? see, I see. I, and I want, I want to hear more about that in a second, but, yeah. but let's let's take it back a, a little bit to uh, your elementary school uh, uh, and junior high years. Why don't you talk a little bit about, about them, what school was like for you, um, you know, things you were doing around the neighborhood at the time, yeah. things like that. Um, Jun both school public um, like elementary and middle school yeah. was always a challenge because you know you know I, I, I'm Dominican but you know I'm not to um, uh, I don't look like if I'm uh, Dominican if you yeah. have your stereotypical Dominican which is incorrect because there's sure. no face of a Dominican right that's right uh, I you know so I I will always pass people would think out Irish or German or Italian or at least Puerto Rican yeah sure uh, so in uh, elementary it was always something about race yeah where they, they thought I was a white kid yeah, in the yeah, neighborhood yeah. so uh, it was always a, you know got to defend yourself all the time sure you sure. know uh, when I went to uh, middle school junior high school it was the same thing you know uh, Pretty much up to my senior year, I still had to continue to prove myself. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I think like the after the first quarter of se uh, uh, senior year in junior high school, I, I guess I gained the respect. I, I, I wasn't bothered with <laughs> no one messing around with me no more. Were, were there were there very many uh, actual white kids in the neighborhood? Not that really. There, there was there was one who lived um, at one fourteen, um, no one hundred six um, Elliot, and his name was Raymond Brown. Uh, and Raymond Brown was Jewish, I see, and so I see. he and he he was the only one. And there were some other people, people like older folks. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But Raymond Brown was there, and me and Armando, we would hang out with Raymond Brown. Yeah. He was really cool. Yeah, you know, very smart kid. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, for elementary, you know, I went to uh, CS sixty four. Um, I, I got good fond memories from there yeah. as well. I went to um, one seventeen. Yeah. I, I have a good fond memories there. Uh, but the most strongest memory is always me defending myself. We're at, at the at the point on Elliott Place where you and Armando's family and your like extended family were you all some of the first Dominicans on the block. Yeah, I believe so. I believe yeah. so. I think they might have been maybe a, uh, a Puerto Rican family or Cuban family there. Yeah. But I think we were probably the first Dominican. Okay, well, because yeah. it was mostly Jewish and Irish, mostly Jewish. You know, That's right? Yeah, in that area. Yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, like, what what are some other things that you and Armando and maybe some other neighborhood uh, friends would do for fun, like around the neighborhood? Oh yeah, we used to play stickball, okay, yeah, yeah. two hand touch football. We'll play off the point where you take a spalding and the facade of the building will have like maybe on the bottom or some uh, a piece you have to break, and then you might have some sandstone. Oh sure, And it will sure, be sure. A, a, a a lip. Yeah. You use that. That will be the point. So you hit that almost like simulate a bat. And you know, so we'll catch it or whatever. And they dropped it. That I'm on first base yeah. without actually having playing base for us or sick ball. Uh, we play slugs. Slugs was like a, 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 a version of handball, but it was more low, oh, low profile. I see, I see. And you try to spin the, the ball by slicing up and make it spin. Yeah. We play. Um, you know, we play stuff where you know we play cops and robbers. Sure, sure. You know, jumping through roofs. You know, stuff like that. Um, you know, that was the primary thing. Kick the can was a big thing. Yeah. A piece of butter. Yeah. Um, we played a game called Mafies where, um, you know, you got a city sidewalk. And usually when they when they put the cement, they square it off. Yeah. So you got four squares. So a group of people was, of us will be there, maybe 15, 20, right? And we have to stay in with those four squares, huh. right? And then... Uh, the mafias. I don't know what mafias means. Yeah. Uh, but I, the, the mafias will say me. I will yeah. come in, and then if I jump into those squares, where everyone, everyone had to freeze, huh. and I had to see if anyone twitched the move. If they did, I call out mafias, and everyone starts hitting. Them. <laughs> but the yeah. flip side of that, if I'm walking by and you're seeing very still, and yeah. I'm walking by, you get to hit me. But I can, if I didn't see you hit me. <laughs> I can't do anything about it. That's funny. I, I never heard someone mention that game before. Every other game you mentioned, I heard people mention. That's that's funny. Yeah, yeah. That was before. that was a that happened a lot. A lot of kids didn't want to play it, but in, you know, hot summer day, a lot of people yep. pissed off. A lot of people were playing. Yep. Yep. Get the aggression out. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure y'all opened up the, the fire hydrant on the yeah. Floor and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, you know, we'll have you know sitting down on the sidewalk, scraping a can, keep scraping. Have someone throw water while I'm scraping. <laughs> 
keep water for the friction, uh -huh. and then finally you, you you grind it down so low that it just pops off the yep. lid, and then you use that to you know funnel the water from yep. the pump. You know? Absolutely, that's what we did as the kids. Absolutely, yeah. and uh, in in your like household when you were growing up, uh, what kinds of music do you remember your parents? Uh, yeah. Uh, Music was always happening in my house, uh, you know, besides Spanish music, yeah. like, you know, merengue, uh, uh, salsa, sure. old folk Spanish stuff. Sure. Um, we also, you know, there was a lot of disco okay, happening. Yeah. There was a lot of oldies. My dad was really into, like, you know, Blue Eyes, Frank Sinatra, the, the Rat Pack, sure. you know, uh, Nat King Cole, you know, Bing Crosby. He always played that stuff. Um we listen to, you know, all the, you know, discos from Michael Jackson, you know, to the early hip hop stuff like Furious Five, sure. you know, Sugar Hill, uh, UTFO, Ro Roxanne, Roxanne. So music was always there, wow. you know. Uh, classic rock was not really much there until my oldest uh, sister, Gina. Uh, Gina, uh, she actually influenced me a lot of the classic rock. I see. And the reason for it is she went to Sullivan County community college yeah. and she went up there and a lot of more kids into class of rock ah, i see so that's how she put me on actually she put me on with cat stevens first okay okay that was you know that was with, uh and joan baez yeah and so and then she gave me she let me know about the led zeppelin but i didn't understood understood it until later on down the line i understood it you know so she opened me up to you know that music uh, but that was the music that was basically being played on uh, in my home in the neighborhood. Yeah, it was definitely disco to hip hop uh -huh. to Spanish music. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so how old were you when you started, you know, exploring? I guess the heavier genres of rock. And my, I would say my uh, the senior year in middle school, junior high school. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right uh, into high school. I see. You know, uh, I, 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 I was really intrigued with the new wave. Yeah. Like the Duran Durans. Sure. Um, well, you know, a Flock of Seagulls, you know, Tears for Fears. Tears for Fears. Yeah, yeah. stuff like Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Uh, a lot of U2. Yes. You know, um, I was really uh, heavily influenced with, with that. Um, and then I started getting into more of the heavier stuff. That The heavier stuff meaning more of the hard rock stuff. Yep, yep. And it was um, uh, in school... Um, one of my friends, James Gonzalez, who's a, uh, a police officer and I, um, after we got out of school, and Norman Thomas, he goes, hey, take this home and listen to it. And I'm like, what is this? And all I see is just a black album and a black pentagram. And it was a Motley Crue shot at the double. Ah, uh, you know? okay, okay. And I actually sure, thought those sure. were chicks. You know, yeah. Early on. Oh, it's a pretty hot chick. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, before I find out later on, you know, they weren't. You know. And that was that whole, I wasn't aware about that whole glam thing. Yes, but sure. I remember take, coming home, and my mom, and, you know, very uh, Catholic upbringing. My mom didn't like anything about witchcraft or anything like that. So it was my luck. I came home. It was a Friday. No one was home. Right? I went to the record player, put it on, and then I heard in the beginning, good over power evil. I'm like, what the hell is this? Uh -huh. You know? And I heard shout. So and I was like, hold, I stopped it. I was like, I didn't understand what I was listening to. Yeah. You know, the guitar was so green, so raw, you know. Um, then I called up Armando. Like, you know, you know, we had cell phones. I went on the phone in the kitchen. I was like, dude, you got to come down here. You got to listen to this. You know, he came down. He's like, what the hell is that? Yep. You know? Um, and then, you know, obviously my mom came home and she was like, what, what's all this satanic stuff? Take this out of my house, you know. That was in it. I didn't get to it, it, it. I didn't even get through the whole album. Well, I, only got to, I think I got up to uh, "Looks That Kill." Okay, okay, you know. Wow, okay. And then not until a couple of days later, and me uh, telling my friend James that uh, I don't know where the album is at because <laughs> I didn't finish listening to it. <laughs> I find like a week later I finished listening to it. Yeah. You know? And then you know I went and got the tape. Oh, the cassette tape, I see. I see. I you see. Know? So that was my introduction to hard rock sure. music. And then from there, um, you know, reading a lot of fanzine magazines, like Cream magazines or Guitar yeah. magazine, this is where um, I ran into uh, Metallica. I see, I see. You know? Yeah. And the thing about I, I haven't heard a piece of music from Metallica yet. And this is pretty much where the Rider Lightning was, came out and it's going into the Master Puppets. Oh, I 
I see. I see. And I remember reading an article about them, and it was one picture. It's all four of them with clip written. There's somewhere, I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe in Europe, there's somewhere on a road, right? And it's just a road, and there's nothing. It's just darkness. Yeah. yeah? And it looks like, they look. They didn't look like, I thought they were from Europe. I didn't even know they were from America. Yeah. Uh, let alone, you know, the Bay Area. Yes. They look like they were from Europe. European guys, right? Uh, and it just looked, that picture was just like, something's going to come behind them and just yeah. like run them over. They had this just mystique to them. Yeah, sure. So... I started reading about it. Master Puppets came out. I started reading about that. You wrote great reviews. At this point, I'm playing guitar. Uh, yeah, I'm understanding you things. Asking. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I went down to City Hall, um, J and R Music. Okay, yeah. I used to go down there and get music. I went down there. I purchased it. I had my Walkman. I got it on the four train going back home to the Bronx. I put it on. I remember I, there was no one on in, in the car. I was in those little two seaters next to the conductor booth and yeah, stuff. Yeah, like. yeah. I sat down there. And uh, the first note to battery comes in, and I was like, hooked. I didn't hear no distortion. I just heard that, da -da -da -da, and I, I was that was it. And you know, the rest is history with them. And then you know, I, I told her mama about it. I said, yo, yeah. just forget about all that stuff. Listen to this stuff. Yeah, you know, and and, and that opened up things like to Megadeth, to Slayer, sure. you know, to Wasp, to Rat, you know, um, to Celtic Frost. Yeah. To heavier, you know, things that you know normally I wouldn't have been accustomed to listening to. Yeah, sure, sure. Metallica definitely opened up, and, and what it got me with them is that the precision, the precision of them playing. That's right. Yeah. You know, and you know, James Hetfield. You know, I don't think he gets enough credit as a, a underrated guitar player, but his down picking is amazing. Yeah. You know, at a point, is. I was able to man. You know, I'm getting back to that. But yeah. then I went into the slacker of this alternate. You know, uh, strumming. I see, I see, I see, I'm I see. getting back to that all down that, because that takes some chops. <laughs> yeah, that that's where it's at. You know, yeah. so that that was my introduction. You know, how where I went from listening to disco to oh, oh the Rat Pack to Spanish to disco to hip hop to some classic rock to some new wave, then into some thrash metal. Wow, yeah. wow. So how old were you? Well, I guess I guess Master of Puppets just came out, so you were. You were what, maybe like... I was 16 or... Yeah, 16. Yeah, 16, okay. 16, 17 around there. I see. So you were already going to high school in Manhattan. Yeah, Manhattan. I'm at Norman Thomas in Manhattan, yeah. Okay, and when, when, when did you pick up guitar? When did you start playing guitar? Um, around the same age, around, okay. I would say 16, 17. I see. And uh, how I got introduced to guitar, we had, me and Amano had a, a, a mutual friend called Mark, Marco Spinguela. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and he, you know, he listened to the music too, and you know, he was the first. He was the first out of all of us who got a guitar. And he actually got a. You know, I don't know if you ever seen those mail order things. They call it Figure Hut. Oh. It, it's so. like they, you know, they they charge you more than the product is worth, like a hundred times. Oh, sure. sure so they sure. let you pay it off in, in, in uh, and and storm it without a credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember he got a, a harmony guitar with a little amp, oh, and I was excited. Yeah. And um, he played it, and I was like, "Why doesn't it sound like the guitars we know?" <laughs> you know, it was clean. Sure, you know? sure. At that point, I didn't understand what an overdrive distortion that makes that sound, and a lot of these popular albums, the guitars, sure, were doing. And you know, then we figured it out. We figured it out. And but he was the first guy to, uh, that got a musical instrument. And you know, started my journey to this. I went from going playing sports. Um, and then being locked in my room like eight hours out of day. Wow. You know, sometimes 12 hours, all, all 24 hours. And my friends are like, oh, you know, screaming out the window, come down, stop, lay, leave that guitar alone. Want to, you don't hang out with us no more. And I'm like, I'm trying to figure this out. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to figure this out, you know. And from, from what it sounds like, and, you know, you're talking about even Shout of the Devil, it sounds like you always gravitated towards guitar. Is that right? Was, was there any other instrument that you considered um, yeah, um, guitar? Yeah, piano. Oh, piano. Oh, piano. Piano. Oh, okay, piano. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, but the guitar was always a driving point for me. Yeah. You know, um, I, I went with that. I uh, I play a little bit of piano. Okay, I, yeah. You know, I started learning on my own. Um, but the the main focus was guitar. I see. You know, it, it's just, you know, the cliche. You got a guy playing the guitar, 
get into chicks, doing this, you know, get a poster, you know. Uh -huh. And every kid wanted, you know, most kids wanted that. They wanted to play guitar. So that was the selling point. I see, I see. Then it was a very hard instrument to play. Yes. You know? A very, very hard instrument to play at first. But that's that's when my journey began. Where did you get your first guitar? Uh, my first guitar uh, I got from Mark. Mark oh, okay, okay, he, okay. He went to drums. Ah, so you so, got his then, huh? Right, I purchased, I think I paid him like 25 bucks okay. yeah, yeah, for the yeah. guitar and amp, and you know, at this point we're still trying to figure out how to get distortion until yeah, sure. we found out, I, uh, you know, at a, at a music store, the guy slapped me in the back of the head and said, you need distortion, you need overdrive, don't you know what that is? I'm like, no. Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm supposed to know what that is. <laughs> so that's when I got my first guitar. I see. Uh, for him. And, and then, you know, the, you know, I got more, you know, it guitars um, and I first finally purchased my own guitar like a brand new like name brand type thing something yeah. like that uh, but that was my first introduction to getting my own guitar was from my friend Mark Marco uh, and uh, did you go to Bronin's ever to I used to work at Bronin's you used to work at Bronin's okay, okay yeah okay. yeah Andy Andrew yeah and Sid Sid Bronin yeah okay, okay. they're still yeah, around yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Bronas. I worked at Bronas. I worked at Bronas. Started working at Bronas uh, when uh, I was in with Fahrenheit. Yeah. And uh, with me and Amanda, um, I got an apartment on One Eighty Seven Hoffman, oh, Little sure. Italy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was already lit working prior to that. Oh, okay. So, okay. but yeah, I worked at Hoffman. I did, I, you know, I did amp repairs. I did brass repairs. Uh, we had a big account with the Board of Education with brass instruments. Ah, I see. You know, I did setups. I do, I sold electronics, sheet music, every anything that was in there, in there. We were able, you know, you know, I, I sold it. Ah, you know? I see, I see, I see. Uh, so that's you know with Bronas, uh, that's uh, they, and they've been around for like about a hundred years. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, really old store. So yeah, Bronas. I, that's probably a funny. It's funny you bring that up. But, you know, yeah, his music. I mean, that's where Kevin got his first bass and all. Too. Yeah. I remember it's, uh, Kevin and Caesar. Caesar played with District yep, Caesar Nine. Too. Yep, that's little, right. Little, little in their Catholic uniforms coming in. And I guess Loki works there. A Loki work at Broden too. Too right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah A lot yeah, of folks yeah. work in Broden. And the guys from at least one of the guys from Rampage. Joe 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 Rampage. Joe Rampage, Joe Rampage right. is the one who got me into Broden. Oh, I see. And I he see. was a vocalist. Oh, uh, okay. And Loki played for Rampage too for a while, but oh, then it was a, a, another guy. Uh, I forget his name. He played at Kilowatts. Uh, I, I apologize, I don't remember his name. But he also worked at Brown. Wow. Well, so. Okay. Okay. So that was a, a bunch of musicians from a bunch of different. Yeah, bands, a lot. Course, a, yeah. A, a lot of people. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Um, so uh, when you were, you know, starting to play guitar, getting more into thrash and all of that. Um, Aside from Armando, were there other kids in the neighborhood? Well, and, and Mark, I guess, were there other kids in the neighborhood who were into it too? Not direct, my, not my immediate neighborhood. Yeah. But uh, a couple of blocks away, the toll was 167, uh, was uh, uh, Miguel, Mike, Mike Rivera, oh, with District okay, 9, close okay, to Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I remember I, to this day, I, it was a summer, summer weekday, I, I think we were off for school. Um, I had a Megadeth shirt and I had a, a jean jacket with um, Show No Mercy Slayer patch on the back. Yeah. And right here in, in, the, in the South Bronx. And I'm on with me too. And we're watching the guys play off the point, you know, and we enjoy it. And here comes Mike, this skinny dude with like a, a mullet, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? Coming down. And I, and I forget, I think. I forget what he had. All I can remember, he had army fatigue. Okay, yeah, him, yeah, right? sure. I forget what shirt he had. On. And, he, and he came up to us. And he goes, hey, hi. And I'm like, oh, hi. And he's like, oh, you like Megadeth? I go, yeah. And I also like Slayer. He goes, oh, I love Slayer. You know, and that was it. You know, then I met his brother, Pete, Jerry, uh, who at that time, he was the first person I met that actually was in a, a, a band oh. called Alchemy. Oh, Alchemy. Alchemy, yeah. Or they were based from Queens. Uh, they were trash ma uh, metal, okay. uh, uh, like black trash metal. I see, I see. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. And the members were from uh, the Bronx with uh, Mike's brother, Manhattan, Tyrone Flores, uh, Ralph. He's Greek. He was from Astoria. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that was the first band. And so we met Pete, and he introduced us to that world because we went to one of his band practices. 
you know, we see these full stacks. Oh, and, you know, these drums, these drum sets, you don't even see the drummer. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And they're super loud and, and they sounded great. You know, wow. that's where I really, really got the bug, like, to really play guitar even more. And where where they where they practice at? Uh, at that time, I, they did the music building in Manhattan. Yeah. Not the one on 30th Street, but uh, they, a, a, practice, a monthly rehearsal right across from the Port Authority. Oh, okay, okay. And also they had a little spot like, behind uh, Ralph's house. I think it was a garage um, in Astoria. Oh, I see. Sunnyside, yeah, it's Sunnyside. Or, no, it was Astoria. Sorry. Wow. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Alchemy. I, I, I haven't heard someone mention Alchemy before, but I'm going to have to. Yeah, yeah, I should have brought that. To, I found that tape a couple of months ago. But yeah, Alchemy, they, they did shows. They did a lot yeah. of shows in, in, in Manhattan and in Queens. Yeah. You know, uh, a lot of like the, the metal clubs. Yeah, sure, you know? sure, sure, sure. Uh, and, you know, I used to go roadie. Yeah. Uh, for Ty and, and learn from it. Just watch him. Yeah. You know, he's a big influence for, uh, uh, on my plane. Uh, but yeah, that, that was one of the bands that we finally got to see an actual band and then we knew of someone in a band. Wow. So w was your first show, was your first show an Alchemy show then? Or? Yeah. Official yeah. show was definitely Alchemy. I it, see. it was definitely Alchemy. Uh, later on, uh, where the brand bands, you know, yeah. uh, was Lamore's. Lamore's, of yeah, course. Yeah, we yeah. went out there. Armando was with me with the first show. It was forever to go get out there and then. Uh, yeah, the train. Home. Yeah, it's, it's like a, a almost a two hour ride and then like a four hour ride home because you got, you know, the, the services are slower. Yeah. Right, not yeah. as many train services during the middle of the night. Yeah. yeah. But, so, what, what, what are some of the first shows you remember at Lamore's then? Lamore's was um, Megadeth. Yeah. yeah, my sister, G, we couldn't go because we were on the age. That's right, that's right. Right? Yeah. So I, I went down to Bleak of Bob's and purchased, I think it was yeah, Bleak of Bob's on, on Bleak of Street, in, which was a music store. You yeah. could get vinyl or whatever, imports and stuff. And I purchased uh, the Megadeth tickets. I got one from Mondo. Okay. Yeah. Right? Uh, and I got one for my sister because the only way we could get there, my mom would allow it, is when my sister went. And my sister, I think at that time, was like 20 years old. And she yeah. was down on break from college. Oh, okay, okay, sure. So we went, it was Megadeth, Crumb Suckers, um, I forget who else, I think Armando remembers better than me, but I know it was Crumb Suckers, Megadeth, um, I can't remember who the other band is. And I, I just remember walking in, we, we could finally get there, and we walk in, you know, it's all velvet, stuff like that, even the yeah. walls. And we were waiting to present our tickets to the lady on the booth and stuff. And then it had swinging doors. And all of a sudden, the doors swing open. And this guy throws up. Right. Throws up right in front of us and goes back in. Yeah. And we're like, oh, okay. This is, this is pretty cool. You yeah. Know? Armando said, I, I forget the name, but but, but one, of the, uh, one of the TV stations, um, I guess the big Oh, guy, yeah. Um, it was um, the Power Metal. Uh, Power Hour. Power, it was on yeah, um, yeah, UHF. Yeah. On UHF. That's right. That's right. That's right. right. U U sixty eight. Yeah. That's it, where we got on metal influx. And they, they the all, TV all would see like someone getting thrown out. Like right. Out. They had a, a <laughs> commercial for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The kid yeah, with right. the radio, he comes out all metal out, and then yeah. people get kicked out. And yeah. Sure, sure enough. <laughs> yeah. Out. It was like wow. <laughs> it, it, the advertisement's right. <laughs> yeah, <that's> right. <laughs> you know? So yeah, we went there, and uh, uh, incidentally, the, um, that was the night that they uh, Megadeth filmed the P Cells Who's Buying video. That's right. That's that right, night that's too. Right. That's crazy. You know, um, and you know, there was a lot of people. It was just like, wow, we got to do this again. Yeah. And then thereafter, we would make the trip out there with our friends. You know, break night. Yeah. You know, uh, come home, get beat up because you're coming home at five, six o'clock in the morning. Uh huh. You know. Uh, but yeah, it, from there, from Lemoore's, it ranched out to the, you know, to the city, like Webster Hall, where yeah, it used to sure. be the Ritz, you know, Studio 54, they used to have on uh, Roseland, oh, yeah, used sure, to sure. have shows there too, the Marquee, you know, it spilled on to those. And then down the road, we started making trips out of state to go see bands, yeah. you know, so. Wow. When, when's the first time you, you went into the pit? I'm guessing you did it with the first show, right? Uh, the first show, no. I think the first time... Actually, the first time I went in the pit was at an alchemy show. Oh, okay. and it was really not much of a pit. It was yeah. just more like head banging. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, sure. it wasn't like what people know, like slam dancing yeah. or picking up change or stuff like that. Uh, uh, I think that was later on. It, it definitely was Lamar. I think it might have been a Chromax show. Oh, 
I see. Because Cro Mag during that time, they were still around. I just yeah. didn't know of them. Yeah, sure. But looking back, I remember the, I remember seeing the names yeah. during that era of early Metallica and yeah. early, you know, Vegeta and Slayer. Pro Max was there too. Yep. You know, uh, but I think it was it was definitely Lamores. Yeah. Uh, that went in there, did the whole circle pit thing. You know, but you know the Wall of Death. Yeah. Uh, stuff. You know, uh, diving, stay diving, stuff yeah. like that. That didn't happen too much, but at the time it was bigger. Yeah. I don't think I didn't trust a lot of people trying to catch me. That's right. That's you know, right. the probability of me just going right <laughs> to the floor was very high, so I was smart enough to avoid that. You know. Uh, but I, I, I think it was definitely during that era of time when we went to um, Lamora that I started, you know, got in the pit and started dancing and slam dancing stuff like that. Yeah. Did, did, did you ever get seriously injured? In the uh, no, you know, bomb. You know, get hit in the face with brass knuckles. I still got the stitches here. Damn. Um, you know, punch in the face, kicked in the face. Yeah, uh, all the but it's, stuff. It's, those were really. T- uh, not intentional. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the brass knuckle was intentional. Yeah. Sure. You know. Sure. Uh, but yeah, you know, I got I got hurt that way. Yeah. It, you know, it shows like that. You know, you come out with scrapes and bruises, stuff like that. That's it. Yeah. 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 Any any run-ins with uh, like troublemakers at, at shows or anything like that? Um. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, like the brass knuckle brass incident. Knuckle you know, it's yeah. like, let's go at it again. You yeah. know. Yep. You know, uh, you're not stopping, you know. Yeah, there's, you know, if I see something that's not being done yep. correctly or someone, someone's harassing someone, yeah, I would step in. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. um, the stuff like that, you actually? Yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I would definitely, I don't know, I, 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 I would just always, I wouldn't allow to just see, I just wouldn't stand by and do nothing. Yeah. It wasn't me. You know, if, if I see something, I react on it. If, even if I don't know the person. Yeah, sure. If it looks like it's unfair, I'm just going to get involved with it, you know. Armando mentioned, I forget, it might have been a Lamores, but he said there's one time where I guess some skinheads uh, tried to like corner you all in a bathroom and I think his name's Dominican Bob. Oh, down. Dominican Bill with Armando. Oh, Dominican Bill. That yeah, was that happened to Armando, someone, oh, okay. someone you else. There, you there, huh? Yeah, it was at, at Lamores. And I think it was um, maybe the Sunset Skins. Oh, and they were oh, Puerto Rican. They yeah, were two yep, twins, yep, Puerto yep, Rican. Yep. Well, actually, one of them is the one who hit me the brass and uncle oh, that we know each other I, at, a, at a rich show. I see. Uh, I see. Yeah, and Dominican Bill, um, he's a Dominican guy, yeah. tall, uh, um, and he kind of looked a little bit like Le, well, LeBron James, um, but, you know, with more of a squishier face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And, uh, yeah, he, he saw Armando and... And I don't think he probably would have did anything with me. Yeah. He probably didn't think I was Spanish. Yeah, sure, you know? sure, sure, sure. <laughs> But with Armando and uh, I forget who else was with him, you know, he intervened. He said, no, they were me. Don't try to, you know, do yeah, anything yeah, with yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. God, God rest his soul. You know, he passed on quite a few uh, decades ago. Oh, I yeah. see. I see. But I remember that. I remember yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so at, at the high school you went to, were there very many people who were – you know, into this kind of music. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's where it flourished a little bit more. You oh, know, I especially see, with I the see. new wave. Yeah, a lot of people went to the new wave stuff. Um, you know, Def Leppard, the High and Dry sure. album came out before Paranoma. Uh, so yeah, there were people there, and, and at the same set, you know, there were people with the hip hop because I was still listening to hip hop. Still listening to hip hop. Yeah, course, I still listen yeah. to hip hop to this day. Yep. You know, but. Um, yeah, there was a lot of folks that were, I started, you know, learning about other bands. Sure. You know, and learning about the fanzines, the, stuff, sure. the DIY fanzines, and apps, and the corporate fanzines that, we, you know, you would purchase see all the pictures of the bands, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, a big influence in high school. For that. I see. I see. And w- w- were you in any kind of, like, music program in, in your high school? No. No. Okay. They didn't have a music program in my high school, no. I see. No. I see. So you were just doing all of it. Yeah, my own. Just on my own, you know, trying to figure it out. I remember uh, they used to have a, a thing in the back of a fanzine. It was called the Metal Method. Yeah. And it was this guy, um, you write, you would write, some, I think it was six bucks you send, yeah. money order, and you'll get the little pamphlet book with um, chords, right? With chords and a cassette deck, a t- tape, where a backing track. Yeah. To learn these chords and play over and, you know, 
it was one of those advertisements where, yeah, you know, you could learn 360 chords in, in an hour, yeah. which is true because if you take one chord in the first position, you move it up, uh -huh. it's going to be a different pitch. That's right. So you got 24 frets, you, you, you're you sure to have 12 different chords. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> you move them over, you know, it just keeps adding and multiplying, sure, right? Sure, sure. And inversions and stuff like that. So um, I got that, you know, I just continued playing, trucking on, trying to learn that instrument, you know. Yeah. Uh, it really spoke to me. It, it really spoke to me in the sense that um, uh, I, I, if, what I, if there was anything that I was going through or not a good day, I know I could go to that and try to and, and pretty much get lost in it. Absolutely. You know, so that's why I was so attracted to it. Do you remember, like, the first song that you learned where you're like, wow, like, you know, I've really, I've really like, accomplished something? Yeah. Yeah, the first song that I learned was a Metallica tune. Oh, okay, which one? It was Faded Black. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, wow. Faded Black. When I finally got that that picking down, and then you know the first position of chords and stuff like that, and then the beginnings of of the solo. Yeah. So you know it's wow. Uh, it was like wow, you know, and that was through like you know listening, and you know through the fanzines like a guitar magazine that would have the music yes, on there. Like the and, tabs, and, right? Yeah, exactly, and then. Um, you know, this, it, it still didn't make sense when you're looking at it. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. You know, you're like, what the hell, you know, how do you get to that, to that? I know, I know. Uh, but when I finally learned that, you know, I was like, oh, great, I can't learn anything else. You yeah. Know? And, yeah. But that was my first song I learned. Oh, wow, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and when did you start playing with other people? Uh, I started playing with other people um, besides Mark. Yeah. Um, there was a guy right across the street from me. Uh, the, uh, I had a friend called uh, Jose, and he was a comic collector. We used to kind of like com comics, and we used to. There's a comic book um, you could write just called Maha Comics. Okay, yeah. And you know, on the back of the mat of a comic, it will have the order form, and yeah. you check off what you want, and you send your money, and a couple of weeks later, you get your comics. Yeah. Cause we didn't know where a comic store was at, right? Yeah, sure, sure. So his brother, um, the, it was named Shadow. Uh, he was born to the New Wave and then into the, the Van Halen thing. He had a guitar, and he played guitar, and he gigged, and he gigged. And then um, I was, like, always asking uh, my friend Jose, you know, oh, no, I'm sorry, not Jose, Carlos, can I meet him? Yeah. And he goes, he doesn't like being bothered, which was true. So anyway, I finally, one day I ended up in their apartment across the street uh, with, in the parents' home, and I'm there, and I brought my rig over, which I didn't discover the distortion yet, yeah. you know? And I'm trying to play, and then he comes in. He comes over with his guitar, and he sits inside eating something. And he goes, "You know, you need some overdrive. You need overdrive. You need a two band." But I, yeah. I didn't know what he meant. Yeah. And he pulled his stuff out. And he, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. And he kind of took me under his wing. He showed me chords. He showed me how to palm you. He showed me, you know, um, how to overdrive an amp. Yeah, sure. You know. Um, and that's when I started jamming with more folks. He introduced me to another person. Not even, I wasn't good enough where he could allow me to jam with other folks like he knew. Yeah. Because other people were starting. And then later on, he invited me to his um, uh, rehearsal, and I got to jam out with them. Oh, okay. And that was, that was the first jam I had, like, I, like with people that really knew what they were doing, yeah. and I'm just trying to figure it out. Yeah. So that was my first experience with him, it was Shadow. Wow. You know, and, and during that time, that's when I first learned uh, uh, a YouTube uh, Pride. He showed me how to play Pride. And I, I, I just learned it for some reason. Just recently, I just revisited it again. Wow. When I'm doing it, you know, those memories came back that he was showing me back then. Wow. Yeah. Um, bef before we move even you know, further in your life, uh, uh, do you remember the first time you met Kevin? Because I know this is before, actually. Yeah, Kevin, Kevin lived on our building, our block. Yeah. He was a little kid. Yeah. He was, um, little, he was like a fly. <laughs> You know, and he has a story that I don't remember. He said that we stole his bike. Oh yeah, he told. Maybe it all. we did. He told maybe it all we did. The world history. Yeah, maybe <laughs> we did, but we did, and we gave it back at the end of the day. The next day, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think we did the heist in the alleyway. You know, which is like you know, mom don't give me a bike, and I think we rode it around the neighborhood, pretty much switching off the whole day, and gave it back to him. But that's the way I I, I knew of Kevin, yeah. and then. He moved. He moved away, and the next thing you know, is he's coming into Bronin's with Caesar. Uh huh. You, you know, with his Catholic, you know, 
uniform and he's playing baby right I, you know i'm like i had to cut time because it was still they weren't buying anything yeah yeah yeah. so yeah, you yeah, all yeah. gotta get out of here come on and yeah you, you were working there right, right. right. Yeah, 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 yeah yeah and then the next step of that was um with fahrenheit when we were about to close we're looking for another um a, a new bass player and you know we asked them and surprisingly, you know, he, he did well. Yeah. He did well. We didn't, I didn't know he was really kept on playing bass or something like that. I wasn't yeah. expecting much. I was like, okay, we'll get the kid for the neighborhood shop. Yeah, sure, sure, You sure. know? And, you know, he did very well, you know? That's right. right. Kevin, out of all of us in the man, he's the most solid because I think Amanda mentioned this to him one time. He's the most solid because, you know, me and Lenny will play and we'll kind of, you know, we like to improvise a lot and we'll flavor it up more, you know, from what we actually recorded. But Kevin was always solid, and, and that's a big part of our sound with the drummer because yep. it's consistent. Yep, that's right. You know, and, and, and so, you know, he surprised me. I wasn't expecting that that early on. Yeah, sure. And then when he came in, you know, we started, you know, we right away, you know, I had songs written and stuff like that, and Lenny had songs written, and he just took it all while, while being in school yeah. as, as well yeah. and not realizing we're keeping this kid up late. Well, he has to go to Catholic school the next day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when did you meet Lenny? How old were you when you met Lenny? When I met Lenny, I believe, I think I was like 25. Oh, okay, okay. 25, so, 26. I see, right I now. see, I see. And how I met Lenny is, uh, and without a cause, Lenny's drummer, Ray Malone, who's another Dominican. Yeah. He looks, he looks like he's from the Netherlands. He lived... He was a super, his family was a superintendent in Mike's building, oh, on District 9, okay. Post 4. He played drums. And I used to go over to his basement. I used to bring this 212 um, amp. Yeah. And I go there and jam out with him. Just yeah. stuff that I came up, a lot of instrumental stuff. Yeah. And when they were looking for a new uh, guitar player, he's the one who asked me, and he told Lenny, don't get no one, I have someone. Uh, okay. And, um, and uh, at that point, I wasn't playing with anyone. Yeah, you know, at all, and then so I went to the rehearsal. I learned the songs. I was like, "Wow, this is real cool!" Uh, and I was in. The next thing you know, is rehearsals next week. You know, I, I, I learned the songs, and that was very important for me because what I learned from Lenny, because uh, Lenny was at this point, you know, he had a lot of chords. Yep. You know, they're playing out. They yep. got songs. They got structure. Yeah. Right. Lenny showed me how to structure songs. I see. I you know, see. once I figured that out, I was like, okay, let's go. Yeah. You know, because Letty already had that experience underneath his belt. Sure. You know, um, but that's how I, I uh, you know, I met Lenny. I see. I see. Okay. So there's, there's some, uh, I guess, a few years between high school and. Yeah, a lot. That's when you were at, at Long, you went to Long Island University. Yeah, I went to Long Island University. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you want to talk some about like the in part of your high school, Long Island University, everything going on in that part of your life? Yeah, they end up um, high school, um, you know, graduated, you know, was playing more guitar at this point of time, you know, I'm a little bit more musical sure. with my instrument, you know, went to um, Long Island University, and I took jazz studies there, uh, and uh, private studies, they've got the, the school, based on the curriculum, the school provided that for you, Yeah, uh, and that's when I started getting more, a little bit more knowledge of, uh, of Core voice things and stuff like that, I you know, see. and learning to read music at that point, sure. you know. Wow, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I did that, I did that, and that's when I started. Like they had all these little small music rooms where you could go in between periods yeah. and work out to stuff, whatever. And there would always be a piano in there, a oh, right piano. So that's when I started dabbing a little bit more and learning from, uh, um, you know, the other students that I, I you know, went to school with. Um, and then I, I stopped. I dropped out because sure. I started. I went to work. I was working full time now, and now at this point, I'm like, you know, I really want to play guitar. I want to get something together. Yeah. You know, uh, so that 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 transition was about maybe a year and a half. Oh. In, in college, I see. doing I that, see. you know, a year and a half of that, and working, and then just, you know, going and meeting people, going to shows, you know, yeah. kind of networking with people, learning about gear. Yes. Yeah, sure. You know how to you know work your gear. How to uh, do maintenance on your gear? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. That's that was all a development period for me. I see, I see. You know? And at this point in time, like, were you still like primarily into metal, or had you started going to like more hardcore shows as well? Um, 
during that time, it was uh, metal, but definitely hardcore. Okay. You okay. know, uh, uh, punk. More yeah. punk. Oh, okay, know. sure. What was your What was your first punk show that you remember? Um, my first punk show, I believe, I believe it might have been at a what was the place? Um, it was off the Port Authority, and it was sick of it all. It was a little, like, on the edge of the Port Authority or 42nd Street, if you okay. get further down in the middle of the bar, there was sort of like a, a lounge area, uh, right? I see. And sure, I went sure. to see Sick of It All. Okay, wow. Well, I already been, I, I heard of them already. Yeah, sure. And I went to see Sick of It All, and, and it was Sick of It All and uh, Ludacris. Ludacris, oh, Ludacris. Wow. Ludacris, okay, Ludacris. Yeah, sure, sure, they, sure. Um, And, you know, Ludacris came on. Great musicianship. They, they, yeah. Those guys were just like amazing. And as Sick of It All came on, it was just full on aggression. Yeah. You know, pissed off aggression. And then how the kids reacted, it was insane. Yeah. You know, I ran right into the pit for that. You know, yeah. it, it was it was just infection. You yes. know, I, I just had to get in there. Like, you, you really spoke to me. Uh, so that was like the introduction to the punk stuff, right? And then I started listening to, you know, a, a lot of the straight edge stuff. I, it didn't catch me too much. You yeah. know, like, you know, Youth for Today, you know, yep. Bold and stuff. There was some nice guitar stuff that I like, but um, I'm more of a rhythm guy, yeah, you sure. know, right? And I didn't hear, it was just straightforward, which was cool, sure, yeah, you know, like yeah, Dead yeah. Kennedys or Black Flag. Yeah. You know, I, I, I learned to appreciate that a little later, yeah. you know, but it didn't really capture me. Yep. Um, and then um, then I heard, uh, I remember reading on a fanzine, I, I go through, you know, a guitar magazine, and they're spotlighting a band. Right? And when I turn, I see Jamaican Rastafarians. Uh-huh. And I'm like, what the hell is this? Yep. And this is what's for, they were reviewing the Eye Against Eye I guess that, album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were praising it. You know? And I was like, oh, I got to go check this out. Yeah. So I went and and I got a, a, a CD, a, I think it was a tape, or maybe it's, a, no, I got the DVD. I mean, not a DVD, the CD. Yeah. I put it on and I was like, holy, what is this? Yeah. You know? It had, the aggression, it had the musicianship, it had the soul that I like, uh-huh. you know, that rhythm soul, you know, uh, and then, you know, it was full off from there, yeah. you know, that opened the doors to a lot of other things, and I remember going to see them, I think Armando was in New Paul's in, in college, okay. came down for some break, and I told him, yeah, I got tickets, you got to check out this band, Yeah, and we went to see them at the Moors. Wow. You know, and uh, I remember that. I think Chromax played that night too. Okay, yeah, yeah. And I remember before the show, before the show at the time, we're in the back. I think it was during Chromax, and uh, uh, Jennifer Miller, the bass player. Yeah. Uh, he's standing in the back of us, so is the the mixing board. Yeah. And uh, you know, you just can only look up because he's so tall, yeah. right? And you know, he passed uh, the the joint that he is at. You know, and. I didn't realize that it was Bad Brains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah. And then next thing you know, the Bad Brains come on, and he's on stage. And I'm like, oh, that's the Bad Brains. Then I see HR come out. He has, uh, like, this uh, white ruffled shirt, like like a mid-century type of shirt. Yep. You know? And it looked like he had, like, a Bible or something. Yep, in yep. Or yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yep. it was just, they went off. Yeah. You know, doing flips and... Didn't mess up not once. It was just Amazing. flawless. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, that opened me up to more of the hardcore community where I started going away from the metal. I still listen to metal, yeah, hip-hop, sure, sure. even disco, and stuff like that, yeah. you know, or freestyle, stuff like that, or pop music. I, li- I like pop music. Yeah, sure. You know? Uh, and I started listening more to punk rock stuff. It pushed me more to it. And then it got more deeper into the... You know New York scene. Yep. You know, like you know, um, you know, you had the, you know, Chromags. You had the Sick of It Alls. You had bands like Burn, of Absolution. Course, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, bands like that. Um, Underdog. Yeah. You know, when I heard Underdog, you know, that was because of Bad Brains. Oh. I and see, then they, they had a different flavor to that. Yeah. You know, um, reggae style. Sure. You know. So you, that's how I got introduced going to that punk scene. I think I think Armando said maybe at that show at that range, maybe twenty four seven spies was there too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah twenty four yeah. seven spies was on that bill. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. That's for when the first uh, saw them. The song that got me was on uh, Grandma Dynamite. Grandma Dynamite. That's yeah, an excellent song. That was a great song, and you know, it, 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 and on top of that, it was 
you know, seeing different people playing this heavy music that, yeah. you know, which I didn't really care, but it was just, for some reason, why why was it more different? Because yeah. I didn't see it as much. That's right. That's, That's right. it. That's it. You, you know? see him, you know, one type of person right. primarily on Right, stage. yeah. And that was it, you know. But, the, and, but at the same token, it was like, oh, these guys are regular Joes too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, right. they're doing exactly what these Joes are doing. That's right. You know, they just have the different stamp on it. Yep. You know? Bringing some rhythm and different elements to yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Um, wow. So, uh, uh, did you start playing in, like any bands before Close Call or was Close Call the first band that you played in regularly? Yeah, yeah. Like I was in my bedroom. I see. And okay. jamming out so and jamming, jamming out with other people. people. And yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, close Call was your first time. Right. Close Call, the re- the way I got into Close Call, my um, Chad, Carlos and Chad wrote the Close Call material that spilled out to some of the district line. It's really Close Call. Both of them are Dominican. Yeah. You know, Chad, Chad, he's a, a Fred Astaire instructor. Yeah. Uh, for dancing. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, Carlos, Carlos was like some, you know, art designer. And stuff. Yeah. But they both Dominican, uh, one uh, from the Bronx and Manhattan. Yeah. They wrote the close call material. I Those see. are the guys. And I used to watch them. I love it because these guys will just come, they'll grab anything, and they'll yeah. just go off and play. Yeah. And you, you really expect it to be in a, like, a bachata band or yeah, yeah, yeah. a merengue band. Yeah, it's sure, the way they sure, quote, sure. you know? But they were playing hard music. They loved, like, you know, anywhere from Van Halen to Metallica. Yeah. You know? And they could play that stuff. Yeah. You know? So when Chad left the, uh, was, left the band, Mike asked me to come in and fill in and play with um, Carlos. I see. And, and, you know, learn the close score. And then it disbanded. Um, but that's how I got uh, to play with someone else, another band, before uh, Without a Cause of Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. It was a close four. I see. I oh, see. But there was, even before that, there was another band. It was my friend Dino and my friend Dave Cruz. Dave Cruz and Dino went to Brooklyn Tech with Armando. Oh, okay. Dave okay. Cruz from Brooklyn, he played drums. Yeah. Uh, and Dino, he played um, bass. Yeah. And he lived in Manhattan. And so we, we used to have a monthly... Uh, a rehearsal place in Jamaica Music Building, Jamaica Queens. Oh wow! Same where Metallica, Anthrax, Royal Pain, all, all those wow. bands had their you know monthly, and we were called Over Your Head, like O V A Ya Head, A T D. Okay, okay. And we had songs, but we never had a vocalist. Uh, what, what kind of music were you? All it was uh, crossover, like thrash punk. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, you know stuff like that, and um, so that that's what I was doing, and then. The close call ah, thing I see. Over your head, close call, and then without a cause. Right. Ah, I see. And in in over your head and close call, were you were you like locked into lead guitar, or were you? I mean, with oh, with over your head, you're the only guitarist, I guess. Right? Yeah, I was the only guitar player, yeah. right? Yeah, um, and, and and close call, yeah, because I was tasked to do the leads that Chet was doing on some of the calls, ah, like I. I you know, uh, one of the songs called I, he has a, a solo. Then later on, Caesar, Caesar did a lot better <laughs> than I did, you Caesar's know. But yes, yeah, but we, you know, that's what we did. That's how I went from over your head to close call. I see, I see, I see. Um, so, wow, a lot, a, a lot going on in all of these years in your early 20s. Then, huh? Yeah, a lot. A um, lot. Are, are there other things you want to talk about before we get into Without a Cause that was going on in this period of your life? Um it, it it was mostly the networking, yeah. you know, you know, like in the Bronx, it was Poe Park. Yes, I was gonna. Yeah, at Kingsbridge, right? right yeah, you know, yeah, we yeah, would yeah. go there, uh, and Poe Park was very unique because one section of Poe Park would be, let's say, Spanish music. Yeah. One side, uh, freestyle. Yeah. One of the heavy metal trash kids, you yeah. know, uh, uh, Caribbean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone kept, you know, peace, you know, with each other, and. Uh, you know, we would pull up. Me and Armando would walk from 170th Street on a concourse and walk to, what is it, 198th Street or 188th Street or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 192nd Street in Kingsbridge. Yeah. We'll walk that way. You know, Armando had a little boombox. Plastic Slayer. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we'll pick up people on the way yeah. that listen to the music and we'll talk, we're going to Pope Bar to hang out. And they'll tag along. And then we'll sit there and more people, you know, congregate, you know, and come and, and, and hang out. So a lot of networking was happening there. Yeah. Uh, that also happened in Manhattan at Washington, uh, Washington Square Park. Washington Square Park. Same deal. Yeah. We'll go on a Saturday, you know, get there at 11 o'clock in the morning, sit at the circle, you know, 
play our music. And next thing you know, in an hour or two, there's 20 to 30, 40, 50 people wow. just hanging out, um, trading tapes. Uh -huh. I got this. You know, I'll loan it to you. Let me hear this. Yeah. And, and you know, then we started venturing out to the community. And we, we you go to A Street, only rock and roll. You go there. You go to Bleecker Street. Yeah. Uh, you go to Bleecker Bob's. You go a little further down. You go to Generation Records. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. It, this is how we you know started learning more about other communities. Sure. Yeah, you know, and learning about these things that were happening right before our eyes that we weren't even aware of. Yeah. So that's that's how you know. Besides going into with Vital Force, I was doing a lot of that. I see. And did you ever get into like, you know, tape trading outside of New York City, like writing to people and all of that? Um, Is that ever anything you were into? I think I did one time in writing. I think it was a kid and um, he paid for a band called Fanatic. And they were in, I think they were from Bridgeport. Kind of like oh, and the reason I, I met him is because it, it was a show on um, ABC No Rio on Riverton Street. Okay. I met him there. And uh, we didn't have no cell phones or stuff yeah, like that. Sure. He actually didn't have a phone. I had a phone in my parents' house, yeah. right? But he gave me his address. Yeah. So I would write to him. And I said, look, look, I got this. And then he would send me stuff. Or he'll make a, a, a playlist. Or I'll make a playlist. Yeah. You know? And send it. That, that's the only time I did that like that. I see. You know, I trading, see. I did that a lot with people at shows Just or, person, or yeah. hanging out at the park. Yeah. A lot of networking that way. Yeah. You know? um, and do you remember during any of this time, were there any shows that you were aware of that happened in the Bronx? that you went to or that you at least heard of? No, yeah. no, no. That, I never even thought to look in the yep. Bronx yep. for a, a show. It was always out of the Bronx, either Manhattan or Brooklyn or Queens. Yeah. You know, but no, I, I didn't, never, never went to show. I went to show to the Bronx, but during that period during of time, the question? Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Um, so I guess, I guess the, you, were you there at the Chippewa Club when, with that, yeah. so that was, maybe, I guess that was maybe the first show in the That's Bronx. That's the first club. one. Yeah. Right, and the triple was funny because, you know, I didn't, I haven't really, I met without a cause. I met Matt Lenny. Yeah. Ray Malone was playing that band. Yeah, and Ovia had actually played that. That was our first gig. Oh, so Ovia Head was in there. And yeah, <laughs> and um, what we did, we played some instrumental music. Yeah, we didn't have a singer. It was yeah. me, Dino, um, and at that time, um. Dave Cruz was in a band. It was my friend Mark Miguela. Oh, okay. So he came and played drums. Okay, okay, okay. So I we had instrumentals where I soloed yeah. and stuff like that. We did that, and then we did cover songs like um, "Rise and Fall" from Leeway. Sure, sure. And we'll have someone from the audience come up and sing. Wow. You know, and then um, Close Call played that show. Uh -huh. Rampage played that show. Again, and these were I'm being introduced to these brass bands yeah. besides Close Call. Yeah, sure. And. Um, yeah, and then I, I remember Lenny. Um, I, I came, one of our friends, uh, Kuba, he was at the show. Yeah. He didn't understand this. You know, he was from the block. He listened to more Spanish and hip hop. He didn't understand what was going on. He thought people wanted to fight him. <laughs> so he's in the pit, and um, Lenny's in the pit, and I guess Lenny's coming across, so he thought Lenny was going to try to attack him. So he grabs Lenny, and the next thing Lenny gets flipped on his back. <laughs> oh, my God. And then. Who was coming to me like, yo, this guy, I'm going to kill him. And you know, I'm like, yo, relax. <laughs> uh, you know, he goes, you know, huh? I, go, I think I do, but relax. It's, they're not trying to attack you. They just, this is how we, you know, communicate and dancing. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, you guys are crazy. <laughs> you know? So yeah, that was the Chippewa. And it was like a VA, v, VFW um, or something like that. Oh, Chippewa, I, I didn't think. realize that. I know, it, I know it was near Westchester Square, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 but ah, so the VFW. I think it was. Yeah, uh, it was old school. It had it, it looked like one. It had an old school little a stage auditorium. Yeah, big hall. You know, it definitely looked like the building was built back in the early twenties. Yeah, thirties, yeah. stuff like that. You know. Wow! Wow! So, uh, so you were you only in Ovia Head at that point, or? Yeah, yeah, okay. and, and during that time, during that time, you know, Alchemy was around. Yeah. You know, I jammed with them, a roadie for them. There was also a band called Curse of Earth. Okay. Okay, with uh, a drummer uh, who happened to be a friend of Lenny who grew up in Yorktown Heights, see. Yorkville, really. Uh, Peter Harbor, he's in California now. He's a chef. Yeah. And um, that band and Rick Lopez, who played in Marauder. Yeah, oh. Right? I see, I see, and I the drummer, I forget the name of the drummer, and um, I think Anthony, the guitar player, they all transcend later on to Marauder. Ah, yes, they were yes, part yes. of that with Saab, rest his soul, um, and with Minus at that time. And then they went to Jorge, uh -huh. you know. 
Uh, but during that time, you know, it was a big community in, in that building, and we would go in and see them jam or go to their shows. Yeah. You know, we had Royal Pain. Desmond, um, I think his name is Desmond Diamond. Um, he was actually the roadie for um, uh, Burning Reeds for oh, Living Color. Okay. He had his own okay, wow. band called Royal Pain. The way he and they sound, he always described it as um, Van Halen giving a party and Bad Brains crashing him. <laughs> yeah, and they sounded that way. Wow. Real great musicians. Yeah, uh, that's one band I thought they were going to. When, when I discovered more of um, like the twenty four seven side, and then later on Bad Brains and stuff like that, um, I thought those guys were just going to take off too. So that's yeah. one band. Definitely archive Royal Pain. They were great, and, and they were stationed out of Brooklyn and Manhattan, I believe. I see. I see. You know, uh, but yeah. So during that point of time, I'm jamming over your head. I'm jamming with these other uh, groups into the building and just you know in the scene, just networking, meeting friends, and hanging yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, what 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 year was it when you when you joined Without a Cause? If you remember, uh, that might have been ninety or ninety one. Okay. I see. Around there. I see. Yeah. yeah. And uh, how long did you like practice with them before you did your first show with them? How long I, I practiced on my own? Or, or no, no. How long did you practice with without a cousin? Did you like go straight into playing shows or with them? Yeah, pretty much. We wow. they rehearsed. We used to go down to uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, yeah. Fast lanes. We used oh, to go down. Okay, okay. Dave Mitchell. Play four hundred chamber right. on Table Foundation. Too, right? Yeah. Yep. Right. Right. Uh, Extinguish the cold. Yep. Um, um, I, I can't believe I, uh, apparition, uh -huh. you know, uh, Dave used to come, he lived in the Bronx, he'd come pick up me and Ray, Ray Malone played drums, then we'll go to Yorkville and pick up Alan, Alec, who's a singer, Freeman and Lenny, Lenny, wow. and we'll go to Brooklyn. So yeah, they rehearsed every week. Wow. Considering, and then I think it was like after the second, I could be wrong, second or third, maybe between two or four rehearsals. Yeah. Uh, we had a show. Wow. You know, we had a show, and then we started gigging, you know, yeah. just playing, because they, they were already playing shows. Yeah, sure, they were already playing you shows. Know, so I came and learned the stuff, uh, you know, added my flavor to it, you yeah. know, with things, and just learning. And again, that was a period of time where I learned structure I with see. songs, you know, very crucial, uh, and I'm grateful for that, that I, I got to experience that, to learn that, especially with Lenny. You know, because Lenny at that time, you know, he was learning too, but he already, you know, he, he already has shows underneath his belt, yeah, 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 you know? Yeah. And he's doing these things. So, you know, that's how I picked up. And it was like the missing link for me. I when see. I'm doing all these instrumentals and doing it, that was the missing link. It, it, it clicked yeah. after that. You know? well, what was the first show you played with, Without a Cause? If you um, I think it was Obsessed in Queens. Okay. I could be wrong. Okay. I think it was there. I think that was the first show that I played with them. I see. Yeah. I keep thinking that it's the Leeway show at Studio One in New Jersey. But yeah. I think that came a little later. I see. I see. But I, I um, and then we did play a lot of shows at Wetlands too. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was a show um, obsessed. Maybe I'm saying it wrong, but it was in Queens. I see. You know, it was one of those shows where I think you had to pay for tickets and stuff like that. I don't yeah. know. If we did that. There was some some friction because we didn't do that. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Of course. You know, the, you know, the promoter at that time wanted you to buy the tickets to ensure that it gets some cut uh -huh. and no one shows up. You know. Uh, but I think that was my first show. Though. I see, I see. So when you started playing with Without a Cause, you obviously added your own flavor and all to the songs. Did the, did the sound of the band start to change at all at that point? Yeah, uh, I think it got more rhythmic. I see. More, yeah. a little, more in a pocket. Not to say it wasn't in a pocket. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. If you listen to a lot of the old stuff, you know, you're like, wow. Yeah. You know, there's one called ATZ. You, 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 I remember learning that. It was like, this is the same. But yeah. now I look at it it's very simple, but it's yeah, still sure. the same. But um, yeah, it, it kind of changed. I definitely added uh, more uh, more of a groove to it. Yeah, you know, uh, absolutely. Uh, while learning these songs and then just putting my stamp on it. Yeah. And how how long was it before first Armando and then Kevin joined up with with you all? Uh, must have been maybe I would say. Two years. Okay. So After you, maybe a year to two years. So you're you're with without a cause. At least for two for years before them. Yeah. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. I see. Um, so before before they joined up during the period when we when you're with without a cause, what are some of the shows that like stick out to you the most? 
Okay. The Leeway Show. The Leeway Show, okay. And, and the studio one. The Wetland Shows. Yeah. Oh, Those yeah, were always sure. great. Um, we also played, um, I could be wrong, but yeah, Lenny really is great at archiving this. Yes. He's just excellent. But I think there was a, a club in Mount Vernon or something that we played. Oh. I think it was still about a cause going into Fahrenheit, I, I think. See. Um, we played. That was a crazy show. But um, the Wetland shows were definitely memorable. A lot of good times at those shows. Um, the Studio One show where we yeah. played with Leeway, that was great. Uh, I think those were the, the two. I think the Wetlands are the most memorable. Yeah. And then the Leeway show. I see. And then and then the, the demo, were, I, I, I just forget. Were you on, are, you, are you on the demo or did they record that? I'm on the black demo. The black the demo. two songs. Oh, okay. No. Okay. Is it? Yeah, the Black Devil, two songs, where my first contribution to the band was Fragments of Reality. Oh, okay. Which uh, but comes right. from And then, Fahrenheit. what's your point? Actually, Frank Collins, who was a, a guitar player for Without a Pause, and then he moved over to um, to play guitar with Marauder. Uh-huh. And then, you know, a couple of years later, you know, he passed on. Yeah. Uh, Frank Collins, Frankie Collins, he wrote What's Your Point. Uh, so we okay. went in, you know, uh, and we recorded What's Your Point, and we recorded Fragments of Reality. Uh, That's my I first see. contribution is that song. I see, I see, I see, I see. Um, and uh, I, what all, like, circumstances led to, you know, the, the turnover, like, in, in members, like, you know, having to find first Armando and then... Um, well, Kevin. with Alec, with, with Armando, with Alec, was happy with Alec, and he was just deteriorating. I see. You know, unfortunately, he had like you know, um, had, had other extra, you know, activities. Yeah, sure. That really, you know, uh, fogged up his craft. I and really sure. like Alec. Alec, yeah. he he was great, you know, uh, but it started deteriorating. I see. I see. Uh, I see. Not progressing. Yeah, sure. Um, so that that's where we, you know, we got Armando with Dave. Um, with, with Dave, what, what was happening? Dave was a good musician at yeah. that particular time. Since I started writing more. It required a little bit more dexterity with things, I see, I see. and it was just wasn't clicking, and, and that's when we ended up with with Kevin. But you hear Dave now, uh, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah, Dave's yeah. playing with his finger. He never used to play with his fingers before. He, he's playing, you know, he plays. Play, huh? I, yeah, I, yeah. I I could attest that because I've been to shows, yep. to apparition shows, and extinguished uh, cold shows. The guy's getting down, yeah, yeah you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know that kick gave him a kick start to do stuff like that, yeah. but. Th- those were the reasons. You know, Alec was he was deteriorating. Uh, we want a little bit more of uh, of a range of a bass player. Yeah. You know, in that area. Uh, so that's where you know Kevin and Amalo came into play. Yeah, yeah. And I know I know you already talked about Kevin coming in and, and what he you know he, he surprised you and what he, he brought brought to the table. But what about Armando? Because he'd never he'd never been in a band before. You know, none of that. So what what all led to Armando? You know, I'm not in the beginning. I wasn't buying it. Yeah. But it was my boy. Yeah. You know, and I know he never did this before. Yeah. You know, so I, you know, when Amanda came in, you know, I already written um, "Settled," yep. you know, uh, and I wrote the lyrics to "Settled." Yeah. And "Afraid," yeah. you know, I wrote the music to "Afraid," and I wrote the lyrics to "Afraid." You know, uh, "Fragments" we already had. I, I wrote my friend Steve Alvarez. He's the one who actually wrote the lyrics. He gave it to uh, me because okay. I demoed it in my house at a four track. Yeah. And I and at that time we were very heavily into Burn. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that yeah. song, Fragments, it's it's an old to burn. It's like heavy rotation of burn. Even the lyrics, that he loved burn too. Uh-huh. So and when Amala came in, I was coaching him with that. Uh, see, and, uh, see, and then in the beginning, it was very monotone, you know. But then he's, the more we played it, more right, he grew into what we know Armando could do now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, in the beginning, it was like, ah, we got no one else biting right now. Yeah, yeah, sure, and sure, sure. It's my boy. Might he as well. was hanging around. The yeah, he just all finished. Time, he, right? Yeah, he finished school. He came from. He graduated from New Paul's, yeah. and I think he was like kind of freelance to get into the music industry. Yeah, and you know that's how it happened. It actually, he offered. He was our manager. Oh yeah. He started right, first right. as managing us. Yeah. And they ended up being uh, the vocals wow, for, the, for the band. Wow. wow. Yeah. Um. So you know, Armando joins. Kevin joins. Um. And at that point, does, does your sound can like start to shift even more? Or had it already kind of shifted? yeah. Um, in the rhythm section, where we had Ray Malone, yeah, who was around, and same thing. Ray it kind of met his ex, you know, 
he wasn't going growing as much. Yeah. So at that time, when we were fast lane, uh, after well, after for uh, with Amanda, we got uh, a manager called Shane, uh, and he had a friend called Joe Scallo from Staten Island. Okay. And Joe came in, and, and the purpose of Joe coming in was because um, Joe, Joe already had gigging and, and experience in playing. Yeah. And he brought in a foundation uh, 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 that we needed where someone could keep time. I see, I see, I see. Joe's I see. great, very powerful. I mean, the, yeah. the um, settle, that drumming that went towards Ray, when Ray, uh, Ray um, Green, uh, the original, for Fahrenheit, like yeah. the the second guitar uh, drummer, yeah. you know, and he enhanced it. A lot of that is still Joe Scallo. I see. So the same thing happened with Joe. We started playing more the fast stuff, you know. We started getting yeah. into writing more things, and, and and Joe was really good at in the pocket, I excellent. See. Sure. But when it came to the faster stuff, so much, you know, it, it was just not clicking for him. I see. So during that time, Ray Ray Green, we call Ray Boogie. He's playing with Close Call at the time. Ah, oh, okay. And he's okay. playing with Close Call. Oh, wow. For now, he also played with a band called Kingston. Okay. You know, uh, yeah, and Ray, you know, Ray's an amazing musician. Yeah. You know, um, and then, you know, um, I asked him, I asked him, it's get, maybe getting ahead of myself, but it kind of asked him when we kind of created District 9. Yeah. Ah, I see. I see. You know, so, but it went, Joe Scallo came into the picture. You had, Alec uh, Freeman, or Alec Ryan, the vocalist, we went with Armando. Kevin came and replaced um, Dave Mitchell. Yeah. And then Joe Scallo came and replaced Ray Balloon. And then Ray Boogie replaced Joe Scallo. And then from that one, that's the real foundation that's of Fahrenheit, right. where we started doing a lot of the bulk of Fahrenheit. And then later on, when we got back together, get, get ahead of we have Lou Medina now, who's always sure. been in the mix. Sure, I see, yeah. I see, I see. And, and at, you know, by, by the time... By the time Ray uh, joined, uh, were, you, were you already Fahrenheit 451 or were you still without a cause? Yeah, we were Fahrenheit. You are Fahrenheit. We are Fahrenheit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah we were Fahrenheit already. With Joe, you became Fahrenheit. Yeah. Joe was around, you were Fahrenheit. And, and Ray was a Mr. Peace because he was able to, you know, he has chops. He was yeah. able to come in and learn this stuff real quick. Yeah. And, and he, he's he's from, is he from Lower East Side? Yeah, he's from 14th Street, Stuyvesant oh, okay, Town. okay, okay, I see, I see, yeah. I see. His parents and his mother's apartment, they, they still own the apartment. Uh, he, he lives in Jersey, he had the townhouse in Jersey, but it's Stuyvesant Town on 14th Street. Sure, for sure, that. sure, sure, I see, yeah. I see, I see, wow. Um, so, I know that during all of this time, too, there's a New York artist, songs that are, um, you know, were, were being recorded. And then the first um, Fahrenheit demo, and I know there's like yeah, two song came out. Yeah. yeah, well, the New York's hardest, but that wasn't for Fahrenheit. That was for District Nine. Oh, well, oh. Fahrenheit was not being heard at all. They didn't yeah. want us. They didn't I ask see. us to be on. I see. I see. The I reason see. we got on that is because of Mike Mike Rivera. I at that time, see. Mike Rivera turned it down, and then he I told see. the one who was create who who was funding it, Jen. Who's doing the record label? She called me and asked. Uh, she wasn't so down, she, down, huh? in my opinion, voice tone and body language. Yeah, she didn't like us. I see. You know, she didn't like us. But that comp did a lot. It did. It did. That right? comp got around a lot. I mean, a lot of people know us from that. Comp, yeah. Along with the other bands that are there. Yeah, sure. You know, and big bangers. You know, VOD you uh -huh. had in there as well. But then you know we got on that. Um, that started. We we're like, okay, we did that. Great. Yeah. And we just kept on trying to get gigs, play, you know, whatever we could play. And then that started moving on. And then um, the demo is the two song demo. We went to Big Blue Beatty, which the, the um, Tim, I forget his name, his last name, but he's the one who tracked all the stuff for the New York's hardest, all yeah. the bands in his home. He had a studio. Ah, okay, okay. So we went back to him and then we recorded Settle uh, and Fragments. Yeah. You know, no, no, no. Settle. Uh, shift and settle. Shift and settle. That's yeah, right. shift and settle. Right. We went in and did, did the two song demo. That got around a lot, and you know, then you know, we started recording more. I see. I see. So during during all this time, you already mentioned Burn is one of the bands that you know was pivotal to the formation of you know the sound of Fahrenheit. What are some other bands that um, kind of unified um, you all and Fugazi? Fugazi. Yep. Yep. Fugazi. Uh, 
you know, all of us, Lenny listened to a lot of classic rock, the yeah, Who, sure, and stuff sure. like that, you know. Um, but, like, uh, Unify the Band, I think it was a lot of, like, the 80s yeah. metal yeah, stuff, sure, sure, stuff sure. and the punk yep. that really formed, and the 90s, in the 90s, um, um, punk crossover, post-hardcore type thing, yeah. uh, that really formed our sound, we were listening to that. But sure. looking at it now and hearing those recordings, uh, I hear my, our 80s influences. Uh -huh. You know, I hear uh, a lot of the high stuff that I do, that's all Edge yep. on YouTube. You know, in Kites of Castle, you can hear it in that other track. Uh, but during that time, yeah, Burn, you know, when I heard Burn the first time, I didn't lie, I thought they sucked. Yeah. You know, and then I got a demo of them and then I started playing it and then I started understanding and that was it. Sunken, yeah. It was like the Bible. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, burn was the Bible, you know, and the reason that we were so hooked on it because it, not just because Chaka was black, it was yeah. because they had a lot of groove, That's but they right. had a lot of grit. That's right. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Metallica has a lot of groove. If you listen to Massive Puppets, you know, um, that breakdown, da, 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 you know, yeah. it's very funky. It is, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Now you heard that in, in you know New York hardcore punk, you know, and done right. Yep. Done That's really right. right, and what helped also was the infamous Don Furry recording. They went did, did it there, uh -huh. that helped a lot because when they put out that EP, it, it's crystal clear. And that's Don Furry's work, and of course, he did a lot of other bands through that scene as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, that structure, our sound, influence, um, Fahrenheit. Um, but looking back, like I said, a lot of that stuff that we grew up with isn't is in Fahrenheit there. right now. Yeah, you can yeah. hear it. Yeah, hip hop too for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, uh, during this period of, of Fahrenheit, do you remember, uh, any shows that you were playing in the Bronx at this point? We'll get into other shows uh, again too, but some of the ones you remember from the Bronx. Yeah. Well, but at Fahrenheit, it was a, a, the Bronx Depot. Yep. Yep. Bridge Row. Yep. 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 That was really great. That was a good, no redeeming play there. Just close call play there. It wasn't but, around for that long, yeah. right? No, not for a while. They shut it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But you had that, and then then you had like um, not too far the Black Thorn down the block from here. Yep, yep, yep. The you know, a Nikki Camp because Nikki Camp used to. We know Nikki Camp from the Bond Street days. Oh, he used to run it in. That's like BLD without a cause, um, uh, district uh, close call. All, all these bands play. You know, uh, Confusion. Sure, sure, sure. They played. So we had um, Black Thorn. Um, Oh, and did, did you work at Bond Street? I know Armando did for a little bit. A little bit. Seezy um, uh, worked there and Mike worked there. Oh, okay. I said, okay. We used to hang out there a lot when yeah. where Mike was, like, after the show, there would be, like, you know, uh, I don't know, like, rave shows, right, and stuff. Yeah, and we yeah, would yeah. hang out there, too. We'd get it for free, hang out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. get people to buy us drinks and stuff like that. I see, I see. Okay, lots so, of the Nicky Camp connection goes back to yeah, Bond yeah. Street. Yep, um, but those were the shows we played here in the Bronx. A little bit early on, when it was with Vada Cause, when I joined with Vada Cause, we did play a show here um, in the Bronx. It was at a high school. It was oh. called Metal Madness. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it was yeah, a bunch yeah, of Bronin bands uh, uh, with Vada Cause, uh, a close squad at time. And the day we were supposed to do it, it was DIY, this big snowstorm came. Uh -huh. So we had to reschedule it. And we, we play there. And that's when a lot of kids got to see us. That's right. Uh, and, and that was like the first true big setup Bronx show. Yeah. You know, it was called the Metal. And it was a high school. I forget the name of the high school. Yeah. But it's it's in the South Bronx. Um, I think Lenny had the name in his oral history, maybe even. Or at least a location. Yeah, he definitely does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he has a location. Does. But um, uh, what, what was, uh, you know, you, you might not have thought anything of it at the time but what was it like playing in the Bronx com compared to other places did, did you register any uh, like different feeling or anything like that I mean, yeah yeah it's it, it, it sucked it was just not that same atmosphere you know you're in the Bronx you finish the show yeah okay you're in the Bronx go home yeah if I'm playing in the city you know if I secure my equipment and, and whatever it is, I could go and continue hanging out in the city or continue hanging out in, in that club. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was the difference. In the Bronx, you really couldn't do that. Other than, like, Black Thorn. Yeah. You know, they kept on. Um, but 
That was the main difference. You came here, it was like, the show's 9-11, everything else is closed. Uh, I see. In the city, it keeps going. Everything else. And you can continue the night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I see. That was the big difference for me. I see, yeah, because it's, you know, very neighborhoody, so everything closes down. and Yeah, yeah. You go back to your neighborhood. And it's not never going to compare to Manhattan because it's 24 hours, you know? That's right. That's right. Um, So what are are some of the, like, memorable shows for you for this period? I I mean, I know eventually you go on, you know, a big cross-country tour and all of that. Yeah. when you're just like, you know, the first little bit of time where you're playing with, um, you know, new members now and Fahrenheit 451 has, you know, this kind of sound that's just come into form and all of that. What yeah, uh, there's a PWAC show down in, uh, in Long Island, Strong Island. Okay. Uh, it was like a center where, it was like a DIY, a DIY center where they helped the community base, yeah. by, you know, post-hardcore kids. Yeah. That was great. I think we played there with H2O. The place oh, got shut down. okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, Seven Willow Street, yeah, you know, uh, was ridiculous. That's, um, that's the Portchester, yeah, Portchester, show, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. played up there, those were really good. Um, Tramps was insane, CB shows were good too, yeah, sure. Uh, Wetland shows, no, no, we we didn't play Wetland shows as Fahrenheit. Um, and then going out of state, you know, you know, some, some shows were great, yeah, no one was there. <laughs> You know, sure. and then we had shows that were phenomenal, and a lot of people were there. Yeah, yeah. You know, but here in New York, um, I, I would say definitely um, was like the Tramps, um, the Long Island, yeah, uh, uh, CBs. Um, we did play a, a show down on Acme Street. I think it was called Under Acme. Okay. And it was downstairs. I remember it was the summer at that time. I lived in Little Italy, and my friend, me and my friend Al, rest of the soul, uh, we bike rode. From yeah. Little Italy here in the Bronx to the gig. Uh, it was summer. Okay, okay, okay. Roll down. And it was high. When we got down, it was like a hundred times much hotter than it was outside. Oh my God. You know, uh, that was insane because it was a small little club. And I think like maybe 20 kids in there. Yeah. You know, if you compare the square footage to the amount of people, it was like 20,000 people, <laughs> you know? So yeah. um, those were memorable. I bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so were you. Were you and Armando living in the Hoffman apartment at this point? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were living right there on uh, 187 in Hoffman, yeah. And why do you talk about that apartment some and, you know, what kinds of things? Uh, that was the hub, the central hub for Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, my living room, I have my friend, uh, Tattoo Tony. He was our other roommate. He yeah. was a tattoo artist. So the the EP cover, yep. uh, uh, the thought of it, you know, in our living room, I had it painted on the whole wall. Wow. Was, you know, it's like a 18... 18 by, I don't know, 12, you know, and he painted, you know, the whole living room was that color, that texture. Wow. And, you know, people would come over, hang out, you know, uh, I think our mom would say, yeah, you know, he used to come and I have a lot of people from the neighborhood, yeah. you know, and, you know, that kind of let, made him leave. I don't blame him. <laughs> I don't blame him because every time he would show up, there would be different people, you know. It was an open house, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, a lot of good memories, a lot of, uh, a lot of parties there, yeah. a lot of gatherings with um, non-party gatherings and stuff like that. Sure, sure. Um, and music, a lot of music, a lot of the stuff we did for, um, well, to become later on for uh, Fahrenheit, a lot of the music I I, I, record, I wrote in that apartment. Oh, you know, I see. The stuff of the thought of it, a lot of that stuff, I already wrote that in my parents' script. Yeah, sure. My four track, I already had it written. And when that apartment, we wrote a lot of the other stuff. Okay, you know, okay, and Lenny was writing as well. Yeah, sure. You know, um, so yeah, you know, a lot of shenanigans there. Yeah, you know, we have Florida University down the block. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. lot of parties we used to crash with Florida <laughs> University and off campus yeah, as well. Sure. A lot of bars there. You know, it, it, it was a fun time. It was a real yeah. fun time. You know? And then it, I bought, I took my bike and rode down like three or four blocks, and I go to Bronin's, go uh-huh. to work. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to work. <laughs> so, so you're working at Bronin's during all this during time? During that then? time, yeah. I see, I see, I see. Yep. And Lenny mentioned in his, uh, this was, I guess, before Hoffman, um, it, there was maybe like a year period where he would come up and every Friday you'd play dominoes with Dread. Oh, that's on, that's on Sheridan, 164th oh, Street. Okay, so that's right. where his, uh, Caesar lived. His that's parents where Caesar lived. lived. Ah. Right. Dre, Dre lived on the first floor. Oh, Dre. That's, yeah, Dre. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. I thought it was Dre. Okay. Right. Yeah, so yeah. he had the spokes. 
And yeah, we used to play. We'll be out in the, in the sidewalk. Yeah. Everyone's smoking out there. It's a hot block, meaning not hot like in temperature. Yeah, oh, I know, I know. I got like you. a hot block, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And we're just like dumbasses. We're still smoking <laughs> in the front. And the courthouse is just right. The 161st yeah. courthouse. Yeah, of course. Both just down the block. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we would sit out there and we'll play dominoes. Yep. We'll play, all of us. We'll play dominoes, smoking, drinking, and listen to music. Any every type of music. Every type of music. And you know, playing bones. Yeah. You know. That's what we did. I think that's what he was referencing. Yeah, yeah nice. and then you know, you, you it, it was bad enough. You see me coming. We see Lenny. That Lenny doesn't look like he doesn't really belong on this block. <laughs> you know, he used to scare. I used to scare the block. I still yeah. scare my 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 old block every time I come around. But Lenny used to shake up the entire block. You know, every and waited to see if like either either like you know, my friend Phil or Caesar would come and greet him. Yeah, if that happened. All right, back to your know, activities. You know? And, and 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 I guess I guess y'all would hang out in was it Mermaid Park? Yeah, Mermaid's was right up uh, right up the street. Um, it's a huge park across from the um, the courthouse, right? The courthouse, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Mermaids are on the other side of One Six First. The Mermaids used to be on the other side of One Six Three. Oh, okay, okay. They moved okay. it. Ah, and, I see. And the Mermaids is where we used to go and hang out. We yeah. know, yeah, I'm gonna be at the Mermaids, and we would be, and we you know we'll smoke, hang out, listen to music, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, snap jokes on each other, stuff like that. Yeah, sure, sure. That was uh, the mermaid. That yeah. was the place. Ah, yeah. I see, I see, I see. Um, so, are there are there other places in the Bronx or you know uh, uh, other places in the city that you'd hang out, like just socialize kind of thing? At this point in time, yeah. At that point in time, it would have been the clubs. Yeah, yeah, you know, sure. uh, it would have been the clubs. It would have been. Not too much Washington Square Park. Maybe the surrounding area, like the pubs. Yeah, sure. You would hang out. Um, and I think that was pretty much it. We'll say, listen, I'm, I'm at this pub. Come down here. Yeah, 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 sure. And everyone would just show up, you know? Okay, I see, I see. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I know also during this time, obviously, you, you record the, the thought of it. You want to talk about the experience recording that? Yeah, uh, the thought of it, uh, when we went and recorded that, we just... We were all sick. I know I had strep throat. Oh, wow. You know, and I think we just came from upstate. I think it might have been Newport that we yeah. played. And the next day, we were going to the studio with Dan uh, Dan, Dan Wise. Uh, great guy. He really he he really tamed us. And, and, you know, we don't know. We didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. But he actually was able to take take us and, 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 and lead us to, to the sound that we thought we had in our head at the time yeah. that wasn't really coming out. He heard it. Oh, I see. I you see. know, and we and the way we, we got introduced to him was Howie Abrams. Okay. Uh, at the time, he was with um, Zamba, Dive, and Roadrunner. Yeah. And he knew um, Dan because uh, he worked with other artists. And we went to his studio, I think it was a couple of days, a week or something like that. Yeah. And, it, you know, that's the first time we actually, besides Big Blue Meeting, where we did our New York's Hardest yeah. and, and the demo, that was more Rush, because it was sure. like more of the same, okay, they get the next band in here. Yeah. This is where time was spent with us. I see. You know, and we, we kind of, you know, talked about things. Yeah. Uh, the vision, and then, you know, get his feedback from it. And, you know, you know dismiss his feedback, but then, you know, we'll use his feedback, and we're like, wow, that sounds great. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? Uh, so that whole recording, you know, we were sick. Um, I remember Ray, Ray Boogie. Ray, I think out of all of us, he had the most recording experience. Okay, I see. Um, and Ray is, is phenomenal, but some, he tends to speed up. Yeah. And I think this is the first time we ever saw Ray angry because Dan was telling him, stopping him. Yeah. We're doing, we're tracking the drums. He kept on stopping it, telling him, you're off time. You know, time. He wanted him to play with a click track. Ah, I see, I see, I see. And he didn't want to play with a click track. Yeah. And I remember that, that alter, you know, the interaction that the first time I would see Ray, like, I'm in time, you know, stomping his chest. I am in time. <laughs> we were like, whoa, he got Ray angry? <laughs> Man, I'm messing with this guy. Because Ray, you know, you would figure he's the one who spoke the most. He did spoke with us, only sometimes. Yeah. You know? Uh, and he was always peaceful. I see. Never angry. Nothing like that. So when if Dan got that reaction from him, we were like, "Whoa, wow, okay, let's chill out," you know. And so that experience, we learned, you know, how to like listen to sounds, how to layer sounds. Yeah. yeah he showed us. He showed us that, um, you know, dial in some sounds with our own gear. Sure. You know, um, some of the song structures. You know, some of you know some of the songs. 
maybe move this court here, yeah. maybe t play with less attack, more attack, you know. Uh, we learned that from Dan Wise, oh, you know, I and, and, and I'm ever grateful for that because wow. he, re for me, for me, he really opened up my eyes to a lot of like the tracking aspect of music, you know. Uh, so that's what I got from that recording. Okay. Yeah. Okay, wow. And uh, at what point did you all? Uh, like, start playing, I guess, well, I guess you played with H2O already in Long Island, right? Um, at yeah. At this point. So, uh, how much, how, how long was it between uh, the thought of it and when you, you know, went on the, the tour with H2O? Um, I think the thought of it was out maybe a year. Year, so a year, right. maybe a year or two. We were when the thought of it came out. We're we're playing a lot. Yeah, you're playing a lot. Just, yeah, we're playing yeah, a lot. All over. And you and you're going you're going like to Pennsylvania and yeah, we're going we're going upstate. to Pennsylvania upstate. You know, uh, we're doing that. Uh, we did some stuff uh, going to the East Coast as yeah. well early on. Uh, and going then like yeah, down to the Carolinas or something. Uh, down there? Yeah, I think it was uh, South Carolina. Okay, okay, okay. that was with VLD. Yeah. We went to Twister, the club, right. the. A tour stop club called Twisters. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned HO. Yeah, the reason we got to play with HO is because they were being managed by Vaughn Lewis, who's strong management. That's right. Who's also now managing us. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I think uh, I know that was a good uh, combination. You know, you got fire and water. Yes, but, sir. you know, they showed the headline, and we did a very good job to get that crowd warmed up for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, it, yeah. it just worked. It yeah. just worked, you know, and we learned a lot for those guys. Yeah. Very grateful. I, I'm definitely grateful to them. But we just learned, you know, you can actually make a living. You know, you're not going to be the richest guy, but you can yeah. sustain. You yeah. can do this stuff. You know, they were doing it. Yeah. They were doing it. And some of those guys, like um, Tom Morris, or Toby's, more, uh, Toby's brother. Yeah. And, uh, um, um, wow. Can't believe a, a Rusty. Rusty. Rusty yeah. They already had a lot of touring uh, with another band from Maryland. I forget their names. Uh, so they brought, you know, they were very patient too. Okay. They sure. were very patient. Rusty was very patient. Um, and we learned, you know, we learned a lot of stuff from that, that band, you know. Yeah. But we did play a lot of gigs with them. You yeah. Know? And that exposed us to other bands that were on the tour circuit to, you know, when they came, we got to play with them too. Sure, sure. You know? And do you, do you want to, I mean, we, I think we can probably talk more about different shows as well, but um, do you want to talk about, you know, the trip out to California and... Yeah, the, the trip to California was great. I think we broke up before we even got to California. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what you I know? would have said. Uh, I know we broke, we, broke the, we broke down. We, we were going, we were supporting H2O, yeah. right? And the guys, we were going to start it in the West Coast. So they flew out. So we had their van with their merch and their gear, yeah. and our gear, and we drove it. That was the deal, right? And they, we had their tour manager with us as well. And when we got to Selena, Kansas, the transmission failed. So we stuck in, that guy, we stopped at a, a truck stop near, and there was a, a hotel, a motel. Yeah. You know, in the middle of, of Kansas. And we're like, wow. <laughs> you know, okay. You know, all I see is a road, this truck stop, this um, motel, this and cornfield type thing. Yep. And I remember at that time I would talk about it it was Warren Lee. And uh, uh Warren, we, we get out, we had to push the van to the to the motel thing. Uh, we get out. At this time I didn't know, you know, there was a, you know, I smoked weed mostly at that time. Yeah. I didn't know there was a a lot of other things happening. <laughs> sure, you sure, know, sure. I was clueless to it. <laughs> so I remember we got out, we got out the van I see Lenny. Lenny's like sweating. It's hot. I'm like, yeah, you know, the van's hot. And then we're out in the front with the doors open up this way on the side of yeah. the van. And it's me, Warren, and we're trying to figure out what's going to go on, you know, how we're going to do this. And then Lenny's smoking a cigarette and he's pacing me out. I'm like, Lenny, you cool? He goes, I can't take this anymore. And then he bolts. He just runs. And I just started looking at him like, why is this guy running? This is just a hundred yard dash. And then that's when Warren told me, yeah, he's tripping. Uh -huh. And I said, well, I'm not going after him. You're not talking about it. You go after him. 
they found him somewhere. We brought him back, you know. Wow. But, but he was still being Kansas right now for a while. Yeah, so, you know, we're there. We're doing that. And now we're hunkered down. We, we were told that it's going to take a couple of days for a new transmission to be installed. Yeah, and I was stuck in Salina, Kansas. Uh, we had a pool there. We had weed. Yep. And, but we didn't have liquor. Yeah. So we saw to the front desk and they told us, you go down yonder this mile, turn to the left here, hook here. I was like, oh, shit. You know, <laughs> we didn't have no GPS at that time. So we ended up going into, like, redneck country. Yep. There's nothing wrong with that, but it was redneck. And it came, man, I'm the only really light-skinned guy in there. Yeah. So I got Armando, I got Kevin, <laughs> and I got Warren Lee. Uh-huh. I got the full Motley Crew colors, <laughs> you know. And, you know, all you see is, like, you know, the rubber flag everywhere. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know? And I'm like, tell everybody, please don't walk on their lawn. Yeah. Because this is country where everyone has a freaking shotgun. Uh-huh. And you get on their property, they're going to they're gonna just unload. Yep. So we finally get, and we find this small shack out of nowhere. We go in there. They thought we were going to rob them. Of course, yeah. And yeah, we yeah. said, no, we got money. Yep. You know? And then, you know, after that, you know, the lady was okay with it. And we got a bag full of liquor. Yeah. And we're walking, and they're clinging and making all the sound. And we're trying to muffle that sound because it's... You know, it's probably 8 o'clock, but it feels like it's in the middle of the night. Yeah, Everyone sure. goes to sleep early. So we finally get back to the to the, to the motel. We do that. We run up. And we get everything squared up. We start going uh, towards California. And uh, uh, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know there was rift between Armando and Ray. Yeah. All I know, we stopped at this remote. I think it was in Utah. I don't know where. It was just a little shack, little gas station. And I'm in the front seat passage side trying to sleep. And I hear this bickering. When I hear this bickering, I'm like, uh, but I hear Ray bickering. Again, this is the guy who's never really any showed any aggressive. So anyway, I hear that and I hear that it starts getting serious. And I, I get up and I see next thing you know, I see our mother and Ray at each other's face. Yeah. You know, and then I had to go in between and push them away. I told them, you stay here, you stay there. At that time, uh, Warren Lee, Kevin, and um, Lenny were in the little shack getting some food. Oh. The old old man with beer. Yeah. And you know, I'm like that that commercial. Like you know, I'm angry. I have a sticker because I was trying to get to sleep. I run in and I open up the door and it slams. Yeah. I'm like, you, you, get in the fucking head. <laughs> The guy's like, he thought, you know, I, I came to rob him or something. Yeah, and, yeah. and we get in and then toward that way, you know, Mondo left the group and stuff. It broke up. Yep. Everything, you know. And then, you know, I guess those two apologized. Ray came to apologize and stuff like that. Then we trucked on. We went in and went to, uh, we met them first in uh, Reno, Nevada. Yeah. Uh, played a gig there. And we went to California, played the whiskey. You know, we went out there, uh, play out with our, our fellas from Powerhouse or, or Oakland. That's right. You know, um, and that was it. You know, that was it. But we, before we even got to a gig, we broke up. <laughs> you know, it was, and, and, and it was coming back, it was very stressful because, you know, uh, this first time we went out, it's like yeah. those conditions, you know, I knew, no one to, I'm used to. Right. I think, I think it's, if, I think if we would have done it again, I think it would have been fine because yeah. now we have a taste of it. You know, yeah, we sure. know what to look for. Sure. You know, it's not all. Cut to glory, like in the movies, That's like right. the Motley Crew movie or something like that. That's you know, right. Going close, you know, you'll be up in the Sheraton or something like that. You know, it's little crappy motels in the middle yeah. of the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And spending, you know, you know, up to sixteen hours sometimes in a, in a van. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, it could, you know, you really have to love it to do that. You know. Yeah. So I'll just give you a, a, a little explanation of the transition from what we were doing with Fahrenheit. I was, we, we had Fahrenheit, and I was writing more, and then how that District 9 thing came about. Yeah. So there's one song, and, um, and this is what Joe Scallo and um, Dave Mitchell was still in the band. Okay, sure. Um, I gave the contribution of Fragment of Reality, yeah. right? We started getting We got that down. And then I, I already had Payback. Payback oh. was already written back then. You, you wrote that. Yeah, I wrote Payback. Uh, I didn't realize that. Well, I love that song. Yeah, so I was trying to get it done with uh, the new, well, the Without a Closet to Fahrenheit. Yeah. But it, was just, it, it, it wasn't just clicking. I see. So 
Mike told me, listen, I want to start a new band. I want to leave the close call thing. I want to start something new. Yeah. And, it, you know, it'll, you know, would you want to be down? I said, sure, let me try it. Yeah. And he goes, you got any songs? I go, yeah, I got this one song. Yeah. You know, I, I had more songs than that, but I had that song. And it will be Caesar. And at that time, Caesar, you know, still young. And Caesar will be with me, you know, I was showing chords, jamming, and he would catch on real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it was Ray Green, uh-huh. right, and Loki. I see, I see. Uh, yeah. We went to Ultrasound Studios. I remember we went down. Uh, Mike said, show us that song. Yeah. Right? And, okay, I showed him the song at one time. And I'm like, all right. I'm like, you want me to show it again? So like, now we got it. We got it. And right off the gate, Mike just came up with some lyrics. Wow. And the band had it. And it yeah. was like, holy shit. Yeah. You know, it was just that quick. Yeah. So at that time, that's why I was like really considering to stay with District 9 because I was being real prolific with my writing. Yeah. And it, it was getting written. It, it was getting put together much quicker. I see. Right? I see. You know, the guys in the band were picking it up a lot quicker. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we wrote, you know, think about it. Loki had that song. I see. I see. You I know, see. Um, I, um, uh, Victim. Oh, you know, yeah, sure. that's Caesar. Caesar had that, like, that Pearl Jam riff. Yeah. And then I added that um, uh, that Black Sabbath breakdown at the end, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. And it was happening quick in the rehearsal, you know. And with Payback, I was doing, you know, kind of like weeks with it trying to get that. Yeah, sure. To happen good. So I was like, wow, you know, I like this. Yeah. Because I could get my idea out quicker. Yeah. And, and hear it with the whole band. Yeah. But the only issue with that is that, you know, with... With Fahrenheit, with, with the transition from with Vodafone to Fahrenheit, it, it it was more organized. I see, I see. A lot more. District 9, Close Call was not organized. I see. It, it, it's just bananas. Yeah. And even when, you know, I got it reintroduced, I said, you know, Mike, we made, I made a commitment. I'll write new music for District 9. Yeah. And we'll set it up. And then you take it, you know. At one point, at that, that first start of it, it was or, disorganized again, and that's when I kind of like backed off. And then we got it, we got it. That it, at that point, it was me, Ray, Caesar, and, and Dave Urban from Jersey. Okay, uh, he's playing bass, and we had it fine tuned. Yeah, I mean, really had it fine tuned, like the 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 rhythm that's supposed to be. Yeah, and yeah, you know, it just fell apart. But that was a big difference. That's why I didn't continue with District Nine. I see. It was because they were just not organized. I see. Without a course. And, and that organization really comes, that stable crowd, that really comes from Lenny. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Lenny is the, the foundation of that. Lenny makes sure everyone knew what, you know, what we're doing, when, how, what time. He made sure that there was some organization. That's I Lenny. See. I see. He, he's, he's the one who, and to this day, he does that. Yeah. He's the one, you know. Um, you know, I know he cries about us be you know get involved, but I'm like, dude, you're doing such a great job already. Yeah. You, know? Yeah. you know, I'll help what I can. But that's the reason. That's why I stood with uh, with Water Falls and going into Fahrenheit. It was because of that organization. It, ah, it was, you know, you didn't mess around. Yeah, sure, sure. You sure. know, we're having fun, yeah. but you didn't mess around either. You know, everybody's yeah. time is valuable. Yeah. So I just wanted to add that of you know how you know that came about with the District Nine thing. Um, and why I didn't record it on that EP. Yeah, I see. You know, I, uh, um, I just asked to give me my credits. Yeah. You know, uh, because, you know, it was just, just crazy. It was I see. Time. I see. Um, and what about I, what about the Malali shows? Because I know that you played there. Obviously, District 9 played at yeah. too. Yeah. The Malali came, show came out. Underground Never Dies is a, a BMX crew yeah from Malali's uh, with Robert uh, Rob Ramos and, yep. and 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 I believe his last name was Peña Lu Peña and uh, they live here in Hoffman too they did down the block oh right okay, and they okay. used to work at Malali's and they used to build ramps yeah with donations yeah this is when the parks department was not was against it so yeah. they built so um Lou his girlfriend May um used to date Lou Collar from Sick of It All. Oh. They were real good friends. Oh, right? wow. Okay, okay. So okay. Lou was trying to get some type of Keenan New York event yeah. of BMX here in the Bronx. Yeah. To create that. And 
he want he got sick of it all to commit to it. Wow. So then he came to me and my friend Joe Rampage. Yeah. Um, uh, for the band Rampage in the Bronx, uh, to see if we could help organize it. Yeah. Right. And we did. We got our friend uh, Uchi, uh, who God rest his soul, he had the PA. He had the bins. Oh, he had a mixer. See. I had power amps. Yeah. So we had a snake to do the miking. Yes, yeah, sir. So we got organized that way. And then we, during that time, we were on the striving for together his records with Kevin Gill. Okay, SFT, okay. Queen's Base. Sure. So you had us, Fahrenheit, you had District 9, you had the Six of Violence uh -huh. as well, um, No Redeeming. Yeah. Uh, but I think, yeah, No Redeeming was on there. Uh, so it became, we got SFT involved and we got Sigabito involved. Yeah. So now it's like an SFT starting to get us in this record thing yeah. with the BMX and the icing on the cake is Sigabito. Yeah, sure. Playing the Bronx. Yeah. And they showed up and it was, you know, concrete floor. You know, it just showed up. We had the PA going. It cocked out a couple of times, but we got it going. And sick of it. I played the bronze two blocks away from the Yankee Stadium. Amazing. Yeah. You know, uh, so that's how we, we became involved. It started with Lou for Underground Never Dies, UND, brainstorming this big contest, BMX contest. Asked his girlfriend to see he needed bands. He knew he could probably reach out to us to get us. Yeah. He knew that. He needed something bigger. All right, and he got sick of it all. Wow. He got sick of it all. Sick of it all to come and play the Bronx. Wow. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I guess I guess you all played with sick, sick of it all a few times, was, right? Is that, was that the only time you played? Uh, I think we played. Um, I think I can't remember. I think maybe the Alive as well. Okay. In um, Asbury. Oh. Okay, I think okay. that that was put together with strong management. I think Sigurdo played that. It was a lot of bands that played. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, many yeah. bands. It was like a Lollapalooza type thing with multiple stages. Oh, wow. We played there. Uh, every band was pretty much there. Yeah. I think we played there with them. I don't think we played with Sigurdo any other time. I see. Okay. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, do you want to talk about you know what was going on with the band uh, after the California uh, tour and, and all of that? Yeah. Yeah. After the California thing. Um, uh, we saw, we went back in and we had a monthly in, in, in the city and we just started writing no more tunes. Yeah. And then, um, we got a publishing deal with Zamba. Yeah, sure, sure. Right? We got a publishing deal to develop these songs. We went in and we started doing that. We started doing pre-production. You know, some of the money was allocated for tour support, stuff like that. And uh, we went to uh, Purple Light Studios on 3rd in, in Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, with Mike Pirelli, I think his name is. Uh, we also passed on, God rest his soul. Um, and we did a pretty production for stuff. And during this time, it was very weird because at this time, I was not living in New York. Oh, I was living in the Jersey Shore. Okay. Two hours away. Wow, wow, that's a lot. Yeah, I was down past Tom's River, down uh, Fork and River, Lacey Township, like um, Barnegat. Okay, yeah. Down there. So, you know, uh, I worked at a landscape company at that time, and then I started designing. Oh, wow. Okay. And then, you know, right after work, I'll jump in my car and then drive up to the city to our monthly. And we used to rehearse at least two, at least a minimum of three times out of the week. So I did that, you know. Um, and then I, I, I was married, having a kid on the way. And during that time, when I was writing the music, there was kind of like a distance between me and my mom, though. Yeah. Because um, where what he did before that, you know, it, it, he, I guess he was trying different things, yeah, right? Sure, sure. So he was trying different things, you know, but it was, for me, it was like, it, it was just like a night and day with the music and the vocal. They were not meeting. Yeah, I see. You know, um, I got disinterested in, yeah. and all that stuff. I had a lot of other things going on as well. Sure, sure. And I just felt like I didn't have a voice anymore because anytime I mentioned something, it was like, okay, maybe it is me. Yeah. Uh, the time I got that validation that I knew it wasn't just me, you know, what I was hearing is um, we're pretty much done recording. We're past production. And Mike, uh, his engineering is producing and everything. Uh, we're in the booth, and then he finally turns to me and says, you know, uh, oh, I hear what you're talking about with the vocals and the music. I see. You know, and I'm like, great. You, you, you hear that now after... I think we spent like 30, 40, 50 Gs or 40 yeah. Gs or something, or 20 Gs, something in, during that time. Yeah, sure. sure. You know, and there was a lot of friction with that, you know, 
with that. And I was trying to find a place where I could express myself to kind of explain it. Yeah. What I hear that trying to pull Mama to that, and or at least he could hear my way of it. But it, I, I, I wasn't the perfect messenger for that to sure. communicate for that. Um, so you know, I got disinterested on it, and then I was like, oh, and I, I was like, oh, and um, I wrote a day, uh, and an overwhelming feeling came over me. Like I was like. All right, I, I relaxed because yeah. I had so much going on, and I had that on my mind, yeah. and not thinking should I go continue with this band, you know, because it, I'm just not feeling it, you yeah. know. And then you know, we didn't talk for years and stuff like that. And then um, actually, the No Redeeming Fellows, the brothers, uh, Kent and, and, and Dean, they were the catalyst. Uh, I think we were at a show. I think um, the Bowery Canteen at CB's. Oh, and actually, they had the canteen. It was, yeah. a, it was a bar downstairs. And it, it was something for No Redeeming or SMT, something, an event that we were part of, that we knew. And um, they kicked the idea. Hey, what about, what's fun? That's great. You all here. What about a reunion? And that's how it started. I see. And then that's what, you know, the music came out that never came out. We added on to that discography. I type, see. The DVD thing. Sure. You know? And then we did that, and then we did, just didn't do any more. I, I started doing something else. Lenny was doing his other things and stuff like that. And then, um, then Armando, you know, kind of put that back in together into the mix, you know. Yeah. And, you know, at, at this point in time, it's fun. It's fun like it is before, you know. There's no really expectations. Yeah. It's just, let's write. Yeah. You that's came it. out with two songs. Yeah. Yeah. We got more coming. Uh, and that's the vibe right now. If we're going to go out and play, we'll play, you know, but that's right. the vibe right now is really just to, to hang out with each other and, you know, write these songs. That's you right. Know? You know, no really restrictions because during that time and the publishing and all that. A lot of pressure, right? There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of people in your ear making judgments, making calls for you. And, and there was a lot of frictions with that, with that stuff as well. Um, and that's kind of typical in the industry. Sure. And, you know, I don't think we we were mature enough really to back away a lot of those things. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, well, uh, uh, one question that is always always fun to ask in, in these oral histories, uh, do you think there's a Bronx hardcore sound? And if you think there is, I think it is. What is it? I think the Bronx hardcore sound is more chug. Yeah, uh, it's more told with the trash, trash yeah. sound, which I love. I love trash music. I grew up on. Yep. It. Um, not more of the metal core because there's metal core. Sure, sure. It's, to me, it's it's and it's there's some hardcore that they say it's hard, but to me, they sound more metal. Yeah, that's wrong. I love metal. I love yeah, sure, sure. But I think the Bronx sound is more that chug sound. Yeah, I don't think it's more that fast sound. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, you know, beats per measure. You know, I think it's more of a, a chug, not so much of a groove. Yeah. You know, just like aggression. I see. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, that's sure. what I think the Bronx uh, sound is, and it's funny because you know someone mentioned that you know what is a Bronx sound? Yeah. Uh, you know, and I'm like, well, to me, it's always been like a chug. Yeah. I like, see. You know, heavy it, that comes from metal. Yeah. That trash metal. Yeah. You know, I think that's what the Bronx sound is, um, and then. That's the foundation, and then you have the different flavors in there that's right. because that's where the groove comes in. Yeah, you know, like you know, you have Shotzi Groove. That's right. Know? That's right. That's that right. was a big band too. Absolutely. They they won the first, you know, twenty four seven. Some of the members were on the Bronx. You that's know? right. Uh, so I think um, the foundation of the Bronx sound is that chug. That, yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah, yeah, that yeah, chug right. sound, you know. And it seems like everyone was into metal first. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I've talked to a single person who was into metal first. Yeah, me either. Me either. Yeah. Me either. I don't think I've, I've met someone who said, yeah, I started off straight, you know, with, <laughs> you know, straight into hardcore and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I never met that. It's always, it always comes from that metal yep. roots. Yeah. It's always going to come from that metal. And what happened is you had the metal roots playing and then you, then you went to the park, punk hardcore along with us that the musicianship wasn't maybe musicianship wasn't as good as the metal. Yeah, you, know, yeah, yeah. You, you can't out front a metal band. That's right. The musicianships on those on those bands, it's not easy. Yeah, that's right. It's not easy. There was one band here that came, uh, uh, Irate. Irate, yes. Irate from Rocks. There. And Orlando, those guys, 
and Phil Vibes, you know, those guys come from that, yep. you know, that chug, but they had a technique yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. And then Phil had his other band called uh, the Jesus, uh, the Judas Syndrome. Oh, the Judas Syndrome with his son, son right? Is it was no, no. He, I think his son came on. He had the, the, the night. The Knights of Black, which is That's another one I waited. That's ridiculous. That's with his son. Yeah, that's with another thing. Musicianship. Yeah, it, it, it's no joke. It's just not powerful as in chugging away. You know, that's right. um, I think those are the Bronx sound. Yeah, that's the Bronx sound. Yeah. You know, I think we have that Bronx sound. I think we have more of the 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 culture of more more groove yeah, sure. sound. But that chugging and all that, I think that's the Bronx sound. That's a uniform you know, thing. Yeah. Right? You, know, yeah. you know, like the four in the chambers. Yep. You know, the apparition, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, Stick with yeah. your code. If you listen, if you listen to those three in Unstable Foundation, those yeah. those are all Dave Mitchell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he did he he has a body of work, yeah. you know, just like Lanny. And you hear it's that chug is consistent. Yeah. That's the Bronx sound. Wow, wow. Um well would you like to add anything else to uh the oral history, any final thoughts or anything before we end? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's this trip, you know, I'm 54 now, yeah. you know, uh, I still feel young and I'm blessed that I'm able to come back again with my guys and uh, play again, you know, go out and play and just write music, you know, write it from the heart, you know, we're not looking to fit into a trend, we never did that. Yeah, you know, like I said before, we came on a scene. No one was listening. We built that scene to follow us because people started hearing our music. Yeah, you know, we didn't jump into an old bandwagon or anything like that. Uh, so, all I, you know, my best advice is if you're doing something you like, yeah, and regardless if it's going to pay you or just give you a a, 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 a paycheck with that, you have to have another job. If you like doing it, keep doing it. Yeah, you know, keep doing it because it, it, it's all about be happy about what you do. Yeah. You know? Um, and that's where I'm at right now. I'm happy with what we have. Even with these new songs, there was some, you know, so weird stuff, with, you know? And But, you know, I learned to, okay, let me accept that. Let, let me have more faith. Yeah. And I'm doing that now where I wish we could all have done that back then. Sure. Because we've grown. Sure. We've grown. So my best advice is, you know, more Bronx fans, you know, definitely. I'll, you know, it doesn't have to be metal. It could be, you know, alternative. It could be That's anything, right. you know. Uh, if you, you're out there, make your voice known. Right now, you uh, the technology with social media, we didn't have that back then. Yeah. Right now, anything is, is, is possible. I mean, you have people selling millions of, of downloads just from TikTok. That's right. That's right. They don't even have a record label. That's right. So do what you love, and if you love it, continue doing it. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks.